Um, so I'm Mike Hearn. Uh, Alex is out there. Uh, we're going to be your helpers for today. Um, so if anybody has issues, wave your hand or look helpless or something, and we'll try to run over. Um, and then I just want to make an announcement. So I created this data buddy channel on uh, Slack last night. So the intention is um, if you have data that you want to read into pandas or visualize with matplotlib or run some numbers with NumPy or something like basic stuff, um, this is a place for you to sort of ask for help and connect up with somebody who's offered to help, which uh, I think so far all we have are people who have offered to help, which is awesome. Um, so now we need people who need help, which is hopefully you guys. Um, so yeah, so put a request on there, uh, however you want to do it, if you want to do it over Slack, if you want to actually meet up, which is kind of the intent, because we're all sitting physically in the same spot, um, you know, grab a space outside between sessions or something, do it on Thursday, do it today, whatever you want to do. Um, so yeah, my intent is just to sort of connect up people who can help with people who need help. So uh, let us know and we'll jump in where we can. So I am Daniel. Um, does anyone have a problem with the text size here? Um, I roughly checked to make sure everything was okay, but if you don't, if it's too small, just let me know, especially when it gets later in the day and you have to work a little harder to, I don't know, see things. Um, bathrooms are that way. Uh, since we all change rooms, it is, you can go out those doors, in and out those doors, or back and left, and motivational speaker is that way. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, all right, so if you haven't done so, um, there was a link posted on to Slack that's really this GitHub page. Um, the easiest way to download everything, there's this green button, download the zip, extract it. Um, and the most important thing is you have this data folder. Um, it's not all of the data sets are like already built in packages, so there are some data sets that we'll be using. Um, in here, um, this notebooks folder is going to be empty. That's where we will be working out of for the uh, for this tutorial. But if you kind of just want to, if you fall behind, or if you want everything pre-typed out in terms of my notes, um, speaking of which, I need to actually load that up. Uh, my notes are in the notes folder. It's really just a bunch of commands that uh, that I am going to explain and talk. Um, you guys through, so there isn't really like a lot of text around what's going on in each command, but if you do fall back or fall behind, um, this is essentially everything that we'll be going through. Um, once you have everything, um, the easiest way, or one of the easier ways, if you're on a Windows or, what is that? Okay. Uh, the easier way, if you're on a Windows or a Mac, is there is this thing, if you installed Anaconda, it comes with this thing called Anaconda Navigator. Um, you can open that up, and it'll let you launch the Jupyter Notebook from within there. Um, if you have other workflows, there's nothing in this tutorial that is Jupyter or Jupyter Notebook specific. So if you like plain text editor and copying and pasting into the console, that's totally fine as well. Um, if you're on a Linux system, uh, you can type Jupyter Notebook or Jupyter Space Lab, and I think that should be it. Um, cool. Um, right. So, if you open up Jupyter Lab, um, so this is Jupyter Lab instead of the Jupyter Notebook. Um, it's got some kind of nicer features. For example, if you have a data set, you can, I think there's a way, yes. There's a way to like preview your data set, um, which you couldn't do in Jupyter uh, Notebook. So stuff like that is kind of useful in Jupyter Lab. Um, what you can also do is have multiple panels, have a console, have a text editor all open in different tabs in your window. So it's a little bit more um, developer friendly. And so that's what I'm going to be using, but if you're using plain old uh, Jupyter Notebooks, that's also fine. So the first thing we're going to do when you have everything loaded here is we're going to open the Notebooks folder. We're going to click the little plus button, and it should open this little launcher uh, thing. And what you want to do is pick, I think, just Python 3. Uh, don't worry about the other stuff I have. Um, and that will, just like a regular Jupyter Notebook, open up a notebook for you. So is anyone stuck here? 
because uh, essentially we will start with this blank slate and we will start learning how to work with pandas. All right. All right, so um, actually how many of you guys or girls um, have stayed, like this is the fourth thing in that whole entire newcomers track? Cool. Um, so for everyone else, um, this should be relatively self-contained, but if you've heard, uh, if you were in the other portions of the intro Python, NumPy, and Matplotlib course, um, some of the things will be repeated, so that's good. Um, all right, so first thing we're going to do is import our pandas library. So we do that in Python by saying import pandas. One of the first things you might want to do is look at which version of pandas uh, you are running. So the way you do that is say pandas dot and then dunder version. So dunder is double underscore, so it's double underscore version double underscore. And typically if you're starting a new project, uh, I think right now you want to be above at least like 0 0.23, um, 0 0.21, 23, one of those um, had a bunch of API changes um, that sort of made everything like a lot nicer to work with and more consistent. But if you're on older systems, this is something that you want to check if you're taking stuff from this tutorial and it's like, this code doesn't work. Um, it's probably because you're on an older version of Pandas. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to load up a, a plain text file. So what we're going to do is we have the pandas library, so we say pandas dot, and now we can access all of the different functions that pandas gives us. So there is a function called read underscore CSV, and this will allow us to read CSV files. So if you're in the Jupyter Notebook and your cursor is in between the set of round brackets, you can hit shift tab and it'll actually print or show you the function signature. So the first thing is going to be a file path and then a bunch of defaults for reading in CSV files. So from our current directory, so we are right now in the notebooks folder. And what we want to do is go one folder up and then into our data folder. So in order to do that, we have to say two dots and a slash to say one folder up. In our data folder, we're going to load up a data set called getminder.csv. And because this is a tab separated value, not a comma separated value, we need to tell read CSV like, hey, the default delimiter is not a comma, it's a tab. So we can say sep equals backslash t for uh, tab. You, there's also another parameter if you look at the function signature uh, delimiter, you can set that to backslash t as well. But um, here for now we will say uh, sep equals. If you hit shift enter, um, so in the notebook shift enter will execute the current cell and give you a brand new cell underneath. And control enter will run the current cell and keep keep it won't move your cursor or create another cell underneath. So shift enter or control enter will be executing your code blocks. And so if you look at this, what pandas did was read and read our CSV file and load it up. So if we copy this line, um, that's not particularly helpful in the sense that like, hey, pandas loaded this up, but we need to be able to save this to something so we can keep working with it. So we can say something like df equals and save that data frame into a, a variable that we can use to route. So now if I say df, uh, you'll see that we get the same exact thing as before. So one of the common ways that you'll see people load up pandas is using an alias, so as pd. And what this gives you is if this was our previous line of code before, df, you can see that we said pandas.readcsv. If we use this alias, so pandas uh, as pd, everywhere where we would have typed pandas dot, we can replace with pd dot. And that just makes it a lot easier if we're planning to work with a lot of pandas related functions. So if you're 
if you were coming from the matplotlib tutorial, um, this is probably import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. So you couldn't, you didn't have to type matplotlib.pyplot every single time. It was just a shorthand for. Around the internet, I, I don't think you see this as much anymore. But you can, you can, there's another way to import things using like from library import specific things. And sometimes you'll see people import everything with a star. And typically you don't want to do that. Um, if you come from other programming uh, analytics languages like R, this will just essentially like wipe or clobber your namespace. And so like if you have a mean function in pandas, it's overriding the base mean function. You don't know which mean function you're actually using. So you want to be able to make sure that every function that you're using, you know exactly which library it's coming from. So we can say, don't do this. So you have this data frame object. Uh, one of the first things that you might want to do is look at the type of this object. Uh, this is super important or super useful when you're, uh, especially when you're leaving pandas or you're working with other functions and all of a sudden what you think um, should work isn't working. Um, typically looking at the type will at least help you to make sure that like, hey, if you expect this to be a data frame and it's not a data frame, um, you'll at least know that the data type is different. Or, you know, for example, a lot of things in scikit-learn expect a NumPy array, or it's really built for NumPy arrays. And sometimes things uh, don't work as smoothly when you're passing in raw pandas data frames. So looking at the type will help you at least debug um, a lot of problems. All right, so we have our data frame. Um, what is another thing that we'll, you typically want to look at to make sure that things were loaded properly? So there is a attribute uh, called shape. So if we say df.shape, what it will return back is a Python tool. Um, and a first value gives us the number of rows and a second value gives us the number of columns. So if we say df.shape, you can see how big um, our data set is. So if you're working with you know, sensor data, like some of the sensor data should be really consistent, so you want to make sure at least the shape is the same when you're loading in uh, sensor information. Another thing with pandas, um, one of the few things that you'll do when you first start it, or load up your data set, is look at df.info. You'll notice that if you compare info and shape, the uh, notation is a little bit different. Um, shape has a set of round brackets after it, info doesn't. Uh, shape is an attribute and info is a method. And you'll, you'll see a little bit more about that uh, as we go on. So what info gives us is you know, the total number of rows in our data set, each column over here, the number of non-missing objects or values in that column, and then on the right-hand side, the data type of that column. So in pandas, every single column, um, you can have columns of different types, but within a single column, it has to be the same type. And if you see object as a column, typically that means it's a uh, string value, but um, if you are working with larger like pipelines and stuff, um, you can have a column where each value in the column is like another data frame, for example, or like a request object. Um, it could just be any generic Python object. And so, but typically if you're loading up a data set from a file, uh, object probably is a string. So I showed you uh, shape as an attribute. If you, for example, forget uh, the difference between a at which one is an attribute or which one is a method. For example, if we call shape as a method, you'll see that we'll get an, an error message. Um, and right now it's saying like tuple object is not callable. And the reason for this is shape gives us a tuple. So it's almost like a list. You'll get a sense of like what, which, what is an attribute, which are methods, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so another one that's really common is df.head. That's just going to give you the first five rows of your data set. Um, typically you'll do this just to make sure that at least your column names got loaded up properly. And just like head gives you the first five rows, tail will give you the last five rows. So for a given 
data frame, pandas data frame object, um, there's three components to it. Um, there is the index, so right here. Um, it essentially, in this case, looks like the row number. Uh, up top, that is the columns of our data set, and then in the body, that those are the actual values. And so you can access those um, independently as well. So if we say df.columns, you can see we get all the columns back. So you'll do some, you'll look at this if you want to rename your columns or pick out specific columns, you can do something like that with dot columns. Index, so that is essentially like the row numbers in this case. Um, this just says right now, um, because these are just row numbers, it's going to start from zero, end at 1704, step by one, right? So Python is a little smart enough to know that like you can imagine if this was a million rows, there's no need to store like a million items. Um, this is just going to be like, oh, okay, I know which how to create these uh, row numbers, so it's not going to be storing them. If you do work with date time values, you can change the index, so that's when you'll have like dates as the index and you can sort of filter um, your data set a little bit more efficiently that way. But by default, it's really just the row numbers. And lastly, you can get the body of the data frame. So df.values, what this comes, gives you back right here is a NumPy array. Um, because NumPy arrays have to be all of, all of it has to be the same type. Um, actually, yes, each column, I think, in the NumPy array has to be the same type. Um, you can see we get the appropriate like, value um, for each row. Uh, this is useful, if, especially if you're using pandas and trying to talk to other libraries. Sometimes if they only expect the NumPy representation, you're going to have to pass in like the data frame dot values or the column dot values. Uh, and we'll see that um, one case of that a little bit. But if you need the NumPy representation of it, um, you'll say dot values and that's how you get it. Yep. Yeah, like like this. Yeah, um, it'll give you D type object. I think this just turns everything into a string. Uh, I have to check on that. <laughs> um, but usually, when you're working with pandas, you pretty much like you shouldn't have to process data within pandas using dot values. It's usually when you're handling handing it off to other things. Oops, D types, D T Y P S. So if you just care about the columns and the data types, you can look at the D types attribute. Um, this is useful if, for example, here year is t telling me it's an integer, but if it comes back as a string, you might want wonder like what is going on here. It's probably someone put in like M I S S I N G or if you're loading it from R, I think it would just come in as like N A or something. Um, that's something to look into. Right, so that's pretty much like when you first load a data set, probably the first couple of things that you want to do just to make sure that everything got loaded up the way you want. Um, so next, we'll show you how to subset your columns. So the way we subset um, our data frame, um, the columns in our data frame, is we have our data frame, and oops, and we can put in quotes the name of the column. So now if we look at country, you'll see that we just got the country uh, column back. If we look at the type of country now, you'll see that uh, what came back is a series, not exactly a data frame. And so um, is anyone, anyone coming from like the R world by any chance? Yeah, so this is similar to like how base R does sub sub selection in, uh, with a single column. So a pandas data frame object, each column is really a pandas series, and a series is essentially an extension of a NumPy array. If we wanted to get a data frame version of our uh, country data set back, uh, we have to pass in a Python list, and so that's why we have two square brackets. So the outer square bracket pretty much says, hey, we're going to be doing subsetting, 
And then the inner square bracket says, we're going to be subsetting a list of values. In this case, it's just one. So we, uh, we are just selecting the country column. And when you use this subset notation, when pandas sees that you're passing in a list, the output would be a data frame. So you get a data frame back. And within the Jupyter Notebook and in IPython, um, one of the nicer references of like whether or not this is a data frame um, is a data frame usually prints out like kind of in a nice pretty way so you can visually see that this is a data frame object. All right. Cool. So how do we drop columns in our data set? Um, there's a few ways you can drop columns in our data set. Um, typically, I use the drop method. And the drop method, you can pick one column or multiple columns that you want to drop. So let's say, for example, I want to drop the continent and country columns. I can pass in a Python list. So whenever we need multiple values or multiple things of something, we can pass in a Python list with square brackets. And by default, um, it will drop things row-wise, so we actually have to give it another parameter um, called axis to say, hey, we're going to drop these columns, not rows. And in the newer version of pandas, you can see that axis used to only take zero and one, uh, which is kind of annoying. Um, and so they, in the newer version of pandas, they allow you to say index or columns as strings. So it makes your code a little bit more readable um, in terms of like, what are you dropping? So we can say access is equal to columns. And you can see that we get our data frame back um, without the columns. If we look at our DF, you'll see that the original one still wasn't changed. So if you wanted to save the dropped columns, you have to reassign it. For example, DF or DF dropped um, to actually save the dropped values. A lot of these pandas uh, methods or these um, things to manipulate your data frame have this parameter called in place. And by default, it's set to false just because if you're new to this, uh, you don't want to accidentally do things in place that you don't expect to. But if I had set, for example, in place equals to true, I wouldn't have to reassign it to another variable. It would just change DF um, directly. So that's pretty much how you subset columns. You use square brackets. Uh, and if you want to subset multiple columns, you have another in inner list of columns that you want to subset. So next, how do we subset the actual rows? There's a few ways we can subset rows. Um, the first way is using this LOC for, I think it's location. Um, and so if we say df.loc, um, and we give it, for example, the first row, um, we can see that we can get the first row uh, back. Likeway, likewise, just like with columns, if we pass in a list of values, so 0, 1, uh, we'll get a, uh, the first and second row back. And just like with columns, you see it, if you just got one value back, um, it will give you a series object back. And if you have multiple things back, you can uh, get a data frame back. So the thing to keep in mind is LOC um, isn't really looking for the first and or the zero and one first or second row in our data set. It's essentially doing like a string match to the index. So it's really saying, hey, give me the row that has zero as its index label, like the label, or, and give me the row that has one as its index label. So for example, if you um, remember from like general Python things, if given a list and you give it a negative number, it'll start counting backwards. So using LOC, um, you can't, that doesn't work. And it's because if you look at the error message, it's gonna say key error negative one. And that's because in our data set, we don't have an index labeled negative one, right? So it's actually like essentially doing a string match for negative one, that doesn't exist in our data set, so it's not really gonna give us the last value, right? All right, so pandas gives us another way to uh, 
subset rows as well called ilog. And this is actually the index, right? So now if we say ilog 0, 1, and negative 1, uh, we actually get values back, right? We'll get the, fir the actual first row, the actual second row, and the, and the last row counting, or the first row counting from the, from the end. Right? And this works because now we're just saying, give me the index position, not the actual index label. So there's two ways that we can subset our data set that way. Um, I personally try to write all my code using LOC uh, because if, if it's labeled or named, it's a little bit more clear, it's a little clearer that way. Uh, but there are cases, especially if you're working with scikit-learn, where iloc is useful when you're trying to get like uh, everything except for the first column, for example. So I showed you how to subset columns, how to subset rows. Uh, the next logical thing is how do you do the two together? So the way you do that is actually the same uh, syntax as subsetting rows. Yep. Uh, what is your error? <laughs> um, do you have it in a list, I guess? Two, yes, there are two square brackets. Uh, again, because the outer one is I'm going to select things, and the inner one is, hey, I'm going to give you a bunch of things to select. Yeah. Uh, so you didn't have a problem in that case because I, in this example, I had three things. But if you, if you actually, I'll show you in the next example, uh, uh, you would have also gotten a total different answer as well. But all right, how do we subset? Um, rows and columns. So um, just like in uh, NumPy or, or for example, R, um, you can essentially have a comma. And the thing to the left of the comma allows you to subset or specify how you're going to select your rows. And the thing to the right of the comma allows you to specify how you are going to select your columns. So for example, if I wanted to select all of the rows, we can use the Python slicing notation, that's a colon that says, hey, select everything here, which means select all my rows. And then I can pass in a list that says, give me just the year and pop column. Right. And I'll give me all of the rows and then just the two columns that we specified. Right. And I said dot head just to give me the first five rows so the output's not like overflowing the screen. So remember the difference between loc and iloc. If I copy paste the same thing as before and use iloc, you'll see that now uh, things will cause, this will cause an error. And that's because iloc, remember, is matching for the index position versus loc was matching for the label. So now that we are matching for the index position, uh, year and pop isn't a valid like positional um, argument. Um, instead, if we say two and four, um, that should give us the uh, same values back, right? So that's just to emphasize that loc and iloc are actually doing different things under the hood. Cool. All right, so what about Boolean conditions? Um, let's say we wanted to take um, our data set and filter it such that the country was just the ones in the United States. We still use the LOC um, syntax. And in here, we pretty much say we're going to take our DF. We're going to look at the country column. So this is selecting the country column. And we're going to compare. So this is um, regular Python. Uh, double equals is just doing to see if they're comparing or it's an e equality check. And we're going to see if the country is equal to United States, or double equal to United States. And then we will filter our data set such that the country column is just the ones that equal United States. Um, sometimes, um, so remember loc is a, um, you can have a comma here, and you can also specify which columns you want to select. So sometimes you might see some people write, hey, um, this is how I select my rows, 
and this is how I select my columns. And just like before, if we put a colon, it means select everything. And so you can, the two are really just the same thing. Um, but this last bit is just a little bit, like you can take it out. It doesn't really um, add anything to your code. Um, so is there a advantage to using log or not using log? I think. Um, you mean, so if you use square brackets, it will only subset columns. So um, if all you're doing is subsetting columns, then you don't have to use loc or iloc. Um, occasionally, you'll get, if for example, you use loc here, and then all of a sudden use square brackets to subset the columns that way, um, you'll actually get a warning message um, coming from Panda saying that um, it's not really sure if you're working on a copy or a view of your data set. Um, and it's going to say like, hey, please use loc. So if, if you're ever in a situation where you're subsetting rows and columns, like always use loc. If you're just caring about just columns, then square brackets are OK. Um, wait, say again? Uh, yes, I think they all return. Ooh, I'm trying to think. Uh, depends how you use it. Uh, I can walk through an example. Just give me a break. At the break, I'll put together an example for you. Um, So let's take our data set, and let's say we want to compare uh, multiple values. So let's say we wanted all of the values were countries United States. Um, we can also have um, and all of the values where DF year is equal to 1982, for example. If you run this, you'll see that we'll get an error. Um, that's, that's not the error I expected. Um, so the error is going to tell us, hey, um, we're actually doing bitwise comparison. That's what this whole um, this whole error traceback is trying to tell us. And so we're using ampersand. We don't use the regular AND when we're working in pandas. And essentially, because we're using uh, bitwise comparisons, all of our comparisons or our Boolean statements need to be wrapped in a set of round brackets. And so if we're looking for multiple Boolean clauses, um, each of those need to be wrapped in its own set of round brackets. All right, cool. So uh, one of the cool things uh, about pandas is looking at grouped aggregates, or quickly looking at like aggregate functions or um, statistics. So we can take our data frame. Um, we can run this. Let's say we were given our data set. Let's say we care about for every given year in our data set, what was the average life expectancy? And I just realized I didn't actually introduce our data set. We sort of just like came in and started working. Uh, so this is the Gapminder data set. Um, I took this from um, an R package written by Jenny Bryan. She processed and cleaned it all up so we have a nice uh, tab separated value to work off of. And essentially we have a given country, continent, year, and some um, statistic about that country at that point in time. And so let's say we care about, you know, how does the global life expectancy change across every year? Um, we have to do something called a group by statement. So these Group by statements become really powerful, especially if you work in you know, distributed or parallel uh, clusters, where you can think of the mantra as split, apply, and combine. So we can, every variable we pass in a group by, you can think in your head, it subset that data frame by that um, column. So if we say group by year, you can think of um, under the hood or mentally in your head, we have a separate data frame for each year um, in our data set. So we have 
all of the 1982s, all of the 1983s, et cetera, all separate. The apply part essentially says, hey, you can give it any type of function. So we can say, for example, we want to calculate the mean. And I'll calculate the mean on each one of those pieces uh, independently. And then the last bit is combine. So we calculated each the means independently. We put it all together, and we get one uh, data frame object back. And so that type of thinking is super useful in like parallel compute, or if you, uh, you might hear about Dask, the Dask library, um, in your time here at SciPy, and understanding how group by works is essentially um, all of that stuff carries over. So we're going to group by year. If you have multiple things that you want to group by, you can put it in a set of square brackets. So in this case, we're just using year. And you can pretend if we run this, oops, we get a group by data frame back, right? It's, it hasn't really done anything, um, but it's really like a special data frame saying that if you do a calculation, I know how to split, apply, and combine it. And so, and essentially, you treat this as a regular data frame. So, I'm looking for the average life expectancy. So how do we get the average life or the life expectancy column out? Uh, just like before, we use square brackets and then a um, call the column that we want as a string. So we get our average life expectancy back. Um, now you see that we get a series group by object. So it hasn't done any calculation yet. All it did is if we give it a function to calculate something, um, know to group or split it up by every value of year, pull out the life expecting column expectancy column, and then run your function. So the function that we are going to use is, for example, the mean. And so now, um, we actually triggered a calculation. It took apart every single value of year, pulled out the life expectancy column, calculated the mean, and it did it for each single value of year, and then combined it all together. The more generic way, so this is all within pandas, the more generic way of doing this, instead of mean, this is really calling a uh, method called ag. You can use agg or aggregate, um, fully spelled out. They both do the same thing. And in here, you can put in any type of aggregation function. Um, so an aggregation function um, is anything that takes in a bunch of values and calculates and returns one value back. So a mean takes a bunch of values and gives you one value back. Um, standard deviation calculates a bunch, takes a bunch of things, gives you one value back. Um, that's different, for example, like a z-score takes a bunch of values and also gives you the same number of values back, right? So that's not an aggregate function. So let's say, for example, we want to speak louder. Okay, uh, I will do both. Um, so if we wanted to use the mean function from NumPy, we can say aggregate np.mean. And now we're actually using the NumPy mean function, or std for the NumPy standard deviation function. So you can write your own function or pick out an uh, aggregation function from any other library, and you can pass it into agg or ag that way. We're almost at our first break, so. So let's see like another example. Let's say we want to group by the year and continent. And we're looking at the average life expectancy, um, so life exp. Uh, I need two square brackets because I am subsetting but also passing in multiple values, so I need a list. So life expectancy and GDP per cap, GDP per cap. And then I am aggregating and calculating the mean. Uh -oh. GDP per cap, GDP. There we go. All right. So this is more essentially the same thing we did before, except we're passing in multiple values. So we're grouping by multiple um, values, and we're also selecting multiple columns to calculate a mean. And you'll see that if you do this, um, first the value or the, 
data frame printed out looks a little different, right? This isn't, if you compare it to what we had before, um, everything was like nice and flat. And now if we look at our value down here, all of a sudden things look like things are essentially grouped. Um, this is what's known as a hierarchical index. And over here, um, if you type in, if you look at the index, you actually get these values as index uh, indices. So instead of the row number that we saw originally, you can see that like now we can pull things out by like 1952. Um, so one, the reason why I'm showing you this is um, I typically try to you know make everything as simple as possible, and so hierarchical, hierarchical indices uh, require a little bit more work or sometimes a little bit more work to deal with. And so if you ever are in this situation, you can say dot reset index, and essentially what it will do is flatten your data set back. All right? And this way you get a regular data frame. Um, this is, you know, that I am teaching you um, in this course, and you can get a regular data frame back this way. And it's all done by saying dot reset index. All right, cool. So, if you guys open um, in the uh, main folder, there is an exercise folder. You can uh, do your work in the exercises notebook. Um, but essentially, for the next uh, 15 minutes, so if you need to go to the bathroom or get water, you can. And in the meantime, uh, here's a small exercise to work on. Um, we're going to load up the tips data set. So if you don't have Seaborn installed, this would also, uh, you would also have to install Seaborn. Here's our tips data set. It gives us total bill, the tip for that bill. Uh, sex, I found out, is this is the sex of the uh, server. Uh, whether or not the table was in a smoking and non-smoking section, uh, whether this is was on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I think there's only three values, um, whether it's uh, dinner time or lunch time and the number of people in that party. And so we're going to work on uh, these two questions. So filter the rows such that you're only looking at the smoking status as no and the total bill is greater or equal to 10. And then calculate the average total bill for you know each value of smoker day and time. So think group by statement there. And yes, so we'll uh, come back at 2.30. And if you have any questions, raise your hand. If you need to move around, uh, get water, uh, do so. So the first one was, let's filter smoker is no, and total bill is greater than 10. So we have our tips data set. Uh, remember, we are using .loc to filter our rows. Um, we have two statements that we want, so smoker's status is no and total bill status um, is greater than 10. So we'll have two sets of round brackets followed by uh, with an ampersand in between. And then we say smoker status is no. So how do we get smoker status? So we say tips, smoker. So that is getting the tips, uh, this, that column, double equals, uh, and O. And then on the right side, we need to also call the same column, so tips. Um, a lot of cases, you'll see people use the dot notation in square, instead of the square bracket notation. So we can also say total bill greater or equal to 10. And is it not called smoker? S M O K E R S. Oh, I need to put that in quotes. Uh, I will put it in double quotes to be a little consistent. All right, so here, um, this is just to reiterate, you need the ampersand and each case needs to be surrounded by round brackets and you still need to subset the column. Um, you can subset the column with square brackets. If you're just subsetting one, there's a convenient way to use dot notation. So we can say tips dot total bill to access the total bill column. Uh, just be careful when you do this, uh, because let's say, for example, we have a column called shape. If you say tips.shape, you don't get the shape column back, you get the number of rows and columns back as a tuple. 
right? So be careful what your column names are uh, labeled um, if you are using this dot notation. So it's super convenient. Just know that you know you can't. Um, if it's an attribute, then you're going to get the actual attribute back. Um, the square bracket notation will always work in that, in that case. So if I did have something called um, shape, I would have to use a square bracket notation. I can't use the dot notation if shape was a column name. All right, so next one. What is the average total bill for each value of smoker day and time? So this is a small review of uh, group by statements. So we are group by, we are passing in multiple things to group by. So we're looking at smoker, day, time. We are getting the total bill column and then the average so we can say mean. And you can see we got, um, so for example, smoking, region on Thursday for lunch, the average total bill was $19.19. Um, the reason why I, I showed you guys uh, reset index is, let's say, for example, given this quote unquote data frame, if you wanted just the smoker column, you'll see that you can't. Um, and it's going to say something like, uh, smoker is not really a column, it's a key error. Uh, and again, this is because smoker is really in that, because it looks different, um, it's really a special label for the row. So if we say dot reset index, we actually get a data frame back, and now we can do our regular data frame things like subset smoker, right? So um, that's just, um, we won't cover um, hierarchical indices, but that's how you sort of undo or get rid of one um, when you're using these basic operations. Cool. So I'm not going to fully close the exercise tab back because we pretty much have one for um, each, roughly every chapter. Um, if you are using the Jupyter Notebook, you can right click up here and rename your notebook. So I'm going to say this one is the intro notebook. And just so everything is nice and compartmentalized, um, I'm going to create a new notebook for the next uh, part. So I'm going to open the notebooks folder. Uh, this was just from before testing things out. I'm going to create a new notebook, uh, Python 3, and we can rename this right off the bat. So the next part is, um, if you guys like saw me teach uh, pandas before, I would throw tidy data like towards the very end, but I pretty much moved it all the way to the beginning because it's probably the most important thing about processing and cleaning data um, that you can learn. And so if we look at tidy data, if we Google tidy data, I think it shows up as like the first one. Yeah, so Hadley Wickham's tidy data paper. Um, um, he specifies, um, he wrote this, I think, in 2007. I think it's 2007. Um, so Hadley Wickham, uh, really known in the R world, um, wrote this paper about tidy data. And it really just defines or put, puts into words um, what your goals or target should be when you're processing data in pandas, or in this case, in pandas. And so we're pretty much go through this paper, but on the Python side. And you'll see that you'll pick up a lot of really important both regular Python skills and pandas related skills in doing so. So let's, look, let's take a look at these two um, data sets. Uh, we have a person's name, a treatment, treatment A, treatment B, and some type of value. Right? And we can transpose this data set. I mean, instead of the person's name on the, on the left, we get the treatment A and treatment B and the name and the value on the bottom. And the point is, like, these two data sets really contain the same bits of information. Um, but if you think about it in terms of, like, how are, you, how are you going to plot this or how are you going to fit a model, um, you can't really pick out a column to fit a model in, right? So he proposed that what, what is actually tidy data? Um, you know, every 
me make this bigger. Um, every variable is a column. Every row is an observation. And I, ooh, I don't even remember what the third one is. Uh, and each type of observational unit forms a table. Um, so we are not really going to cover the last one, because usually when you're working with data, you undo that last bit when you're joining tables and stuff. But He's trying to say that, hey, this isn't actually like, this is the data set that when you're processing for analysis or for plotting, this is the target that you should be uh, thinking about. And this makes sense in the sense that you can now say like, hey, for a given treatment, what is like the result? And you can clearly pick out the columns. Um, and once you get your data set in this way, um, you can like create pivot tables or pivot things around to get any of the other forms back. Um, any of these forms back. So for example, this form might be really helpful when you're, you know, you know, at the clinic inputting data into a spreadsheet directly. Um, but when you actually need to process or do your analysis, this is what you actually need to work with. All right. And so in this paper, he also says um, there are typically five major problems that exist in messy data sets. Um, we pretty much will cover the first three because the last two is more for data storage. Um, so if you're working with databases, this is how you're going to save your tables into a database. But usually when you're like working with data for analysis, you are joining a whole bunch of tables. So we're undoing the last two bits. So he talks about column headers are values and not variable names. So that's the first thing that, we'll, um, that I'll show you guys. So because this is a brand new notebook, um, we have to re-import everything that we did before. Um, if you are working on the same notebook, you don't have to write this again, but this is a really long course, so you don't really want one giant notebook uh, to find things. So the first thing we'll cover is columns containing values, not variables. So what does this look like? Um, so there's a data set called Pew for the Pew Research Center. And just like before, we can read a CSV file. And just like before, it is one file up in the data folder. And it's going to be called pew.csv. So we can look at the head of our data frame by looking at df.head. And this is what that statement means about columns containing values, not variables. So we have, for example, um, for a given religion, um, some income bracket and the number of people in that income bracket. And if you look at our columns, uh, these are actual values for a variable called income. It's not, and what we really want is a column called religion, a column called income or income bracket, and then a column called count. Right? And it'll make the data set really, really long, which, you know, if you're inputting, again, if you're inputting data into a spreadsheet or you're trying to show um, this data set on, in a paper, this data set is really compact and you can fit a lot of information um, in one screen, but you can't really do any type of analysis on it. So for example, if I wanted to group by um, the income bracket and give me the average number of people in it, I couldn't. Right, because the data set's not uh, in a tidy format. So how do we fix this? So, um, yeah. So if we look at our data set, there is a function called melt. Um, if you are sort of coming in from the R world and know about the reshape2 package is literally named after the same function in reshape2 called melt. And so we're going to melt our data frame. So you can think the, the actual analogy I think Hadley had when he renamed these things is you can imagine like a piece of metal and if you melt it, it becomes long. And so it goes from something that's a wide data set to a long data set. And if we hit shift tab, um, you can see that there are multiple parameters that go into melt. Uh, the first one being ID vars. So ID vars, um, when you see ID, um, you can think of it as these are the columns that I do not want to touch, right? So in our case, 
we want to leave the religion column alone, and what we essentially want to melt or pivot down is our, all of the other columns. So we can say ID vars is religion. And the way this function works is if you specify something in ID vars, everything else that wasn't specified automatically goes into value vars. Um, or you can do it the other way around. If you specify something in value vars, everything that wasn't specified in value vars will automatically be put into ID vars. So usually you'll just put in the one that's easier to type. So in our case, we only need to type one column here. And so we don't have to specify the rest. All right. So now if we look at this, uh, we essentially converted our uh, on or our messy data set into something that's tidy or something we can you know, process and go forward and fit a model for, for example. So we have our column called religion, column called variable, column called value. And you can see we, we went from something that is, uh, how many rows is this? Uh, 17, 18 rows to now we have 180 rows, right? So we went from a wide data set to a very long data set. All right, so I am going to copy this little bit of code again. So there's a few other parameters. So since we're in the, in the business of actually cleaning data, so we can say uh, pew tidy some of the other parameters that we can deal with, um, var name and value name. You can see that when we ran this function, it gave us variable and value as default columns, column names, but those other parameters essentially let us change those. So we can set something like uh, var name is income and value name is count. So now if we look at it, um, all that did is change those default column names for us. Right. So when you are cleaning your data sets, you do want your column names to sort of make sense as you're processing them. Cool. Oh, go back. Here? All right. All right. So let's work with uh, a more complicated example. It's really the same type of problem. Um, but this will come from the billboard data set. Right. So we're going to go up one folder using dot dot in the data folder, and there's a data set called billboard.csv. So if we look at this data set, it is pretty much the same problem we had before, just more of it. Um, so we have, I think this is all, no, this is across multiple years. So for a given track, so a track is defined by year, artist, track, um, and the length of song and the date entered, um, and a bunch of weeks, so from week one to week 70 something, what was its billboard rating? Right, so for the most part you expect like a song to have the highest rating on the first week it was submitted and then slowly go down, for example. Um, so this, again, is a data set that's not really tidy because we couldn't say, for example, that question I asked, like, um, you know, given the week, uh, what is the average uh, ranking um, across time for all of our songs, right? And you generally expect like a downward trend. Um, but we couldn't really answer that question right away, right? We actually have to manipulate our data set. And so, but this is really like the same problem we had before, just more of it. So what are the columns that we don't want to touch? So in this case, instead of one column, we have one, two, three, four, five columns. And then all the other columns are the ones that we want to melt down, right? So we're going to run our melt command again. And ID vars. instead of one value is going to take a list of values, right? So 
just like before when we were subsetting columns and rows, if we wanted one thing, we can just pass in that one value. But if we wanted multiple things, we put things in a, in a list, which is a square bracket. So what are the columns that we want to keep consistent? That's year, artist, track, time, and date entered. So we can put that in as year, artist, track, time, and date dot entered. Cool. And then everything else, so the week one all the way to week 76, they'll be automatically put into the next parameter, which was uh, value vars. So next uh, value name, we're going to call it the rank. So when we pivot, what is that, when we melt our data set, what is that column going to be called? And var name is going to be called week. And let's get rid of this. Right. Right. So now we have for a given uh, row in our data set, it is one individual value, right? So for each track, we have a week number and its billboard uh, ranking, right? So remember those three par parts of what makes uh, data tidy. Each column represents a variable. Each row represents a single observation, right? So we have one observation, which is week um, for a song, and then its rank. So I'm going to copy this. All right. So one of the things um, that you'll that I hear a lot is like, oh, I really like R because it like lets me do piping, um, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Python can actually do the same thing. And in general, you do it by wrapping everything around the whole thing um, in round brackets. And you can see like this dot notation is pretty much like a pipe. So if I put an enter here, that might make it look um, a little bit more obvious. Um, let me just clear out the white space here. All right, so we have billboard, billboard, we're going to melt it. And let's say for example, we, uh, let's look at, you know, the average ranking by artist, right? So we can say, how do we do that? So that's group by. Uh, we can group by the artist. We are selecting the rank column. And we are calculating the mean. Right? So this part here, um, really just the same thing that we did before. Um, group by, pulling out a column, calculating mean. And this part up here is, I don't know how to turn off Slack. Just quit it. Um, this part is the actual melting portion. And you can see we are essentially dot training everything because everything's a class in Python. Um, so piping in Python is really just dot training. So we have billboard, we're melting it, we're group buying, we're making a group buying calculating mean. And you can see here that we have for every given artist um, what its actual uh, <laughs> ranking is. And if you want, you can look into the sort uh, method and you can also sort it to see like which artist like on average does the worst or which artist does on average the best. Um, this is how you'll see a lot of pandas notation is using this round bracket um, before and after your expression. If you don't see this, another way you can do this is at the end of each line, you can put in a back back tick, or not back tick, a backslash, and that will do the same exact thing. Um, it's, people say that the first way looks a little nicer. Um, the backslash essentially tells Python, hey, the next line is really a continuation of the first line. And so uh, both results do the same exact thing. All right. So, uh, do you, were you trying to look at the code? Yeah. Uh-huh. I just had round brackets, essentially, uh, before, or just around the whole entire expression. 
And this pretty much says like, hey, treat this whole, the inside of the parentheses as one expression. And so you can have line breaks inside uh, that way. So that's how Python is interpreting that. So you'll see this type of notation a lot more frequently um, when you're trying to quote unquote like pipe your results. All right, let's go back to paper. Uh, so we dealt with the first problem. So the next problem, multiple, var multiple variables are stored in one column. So what does that look like? Uh, we actually need to pull up another data set for that. Um, in this case, um, there is an Ebola data set. It's called country time series, and not just, not Ebola. <laughs> And so this data set comes from a um, graduate student at a time, at the time. Uh, her name is Caitlin Rivers. I think she gave a talk at SciPy or something once. Um, and what she did was during the 2014 West Africa outbreak, she collected all of the Ministry of Health reports and put together a data, data set for the current case count or death count for each individual country. And so she input, or this data set was created this way, and you can see if you look at a given column, so cases, Guinea, et cetera, and if you scroll to the right, you'll see deaths of a country. Um, this value, for example, 2,776, represents two bits of information. It represents whether or not this was a case count or a death count, and it also represents which country it is, right? And so if you're coming from matplotlib, this data set is really easy to plot because you can just say plot and it'll just, each one of these columns will be its individual line. But if you were to actually try to do an analysis on this, you couldn't really tease out um, case counts and death counts, right? Um, let's say, for example, you, you couldn't really like say um, for a given country, uh, group by the country and give me the average case counts across um, each day in the outbreak. You couldn't ask, you couldn't have that question um, right now. So each column has two bits of data in it, and so now we need to fix it. So um, when, that's the, when that's the situation you have, um, you ha essentially have two parts, right? So the easiest thing to notice is, hey, we have the same situation as before. Um, this case death count or country should be in its own separate column. So we are going to have to do a melt step, right? And that melt step is exactly, exactly the same um, that I just showed you. So let's do that first. So I'm going to call it Ebola long. I'm going to say Ebola melt. And just like before, we're going to say ID vars is equal to date with a capital D, because that's how it's spelled here, and day. And then we can say var name is equal to, I'm going to say CD country for case death count country, C-O-U-N-G country, and value name is equal to count. And PEP8 doesn't have spaces around equals, all right. So now if we look at our data set, um, we're almost there, right? Um, we have for a given observational, for a given day, which is an observation, some count, right? And so now the thing we have to do is split this column up, right? And if I say like, how would you like, if I were to give you this column and I told you not to write any code, how would you split it? You might say something along the lines of like, hey, look, there's an underscore. If we can just break up the underscore and take the thing to the left, that would tell us whether or not it's a case count or death count. And the thing to the right of the underscore is uh, the country. So we can actually do that in pandas, right? So just as a small aside, um, hello underscore world. If this was our regular Python string, um, Python can do a lot of things uh, built in. One of them, there's like a whole slew of op operations or methods you can do on string objects. One of them is something called split. 
and in split, it will by default split by a space, I believe. But you can say, hey, split by the underscore. And it'll give us a list back of the underscore and then it'll remove the underscore and then every time, every component, it will come back as a list. So this is essentially the behavior we want in pandas and we can actually do that. So how do we do this in pandas? So ebola along, we want the cd country data set, uh, column, cd underscore country, right? So this is the column that we actually care about. So there's a special uh, accessor um, that pandas gives us. So if we say dot str, this allows us to have access to all of the string methods that Python has, but allow us to work on a column, right? So this is known as the string accessor. Um, the other thing that we saw was um, loc and iloc allows us to subset um, columns. So it's dot loc, dot iloc. Um, str is getting strings. Um, there's another accessor called dt for date time. So if you are working with a date time column, you can say column dt month, and it'll give you the month. Um, another one is the category object, so C-A-T. So if, for example, you have a categorical column, um, so if you remember D-types, if your D-type was category, you can say cat and then have access to all, the, all of the cat category um, accessors. So as another aside, uh, how do you find out like what, what's available here? So if we look at, if we Google pandas, uh, I think it's pandas documentation. Ah, ah, here it is. If you look at the pandas documentation, uh, there is a button called API reference. And in here is how you find out um, all of the things that um, data frames and series objects can do. The accessor methods are all found under series because we're taking a single column out. So a single column is a series. So in the documentation, we're gonna look up a series. And if we say dot str dot um, string handling. So this shows us all of the ways that you can deal with strings in a column, right? So series dot str capitalize. Um, so we can capitalize everything. Um, the one that we are working with is split. Ba -ba -ba -bum. So split. And so that's how, if you really are looking for the documentation for this stuff, um, that's how you do it. Um, your mileage sort of varies hitting like shift tab when you're looking at accessor. So it's really useful to be able to find like, hey, I know there's like str.split, like what else can I do about this? Um, and so that's how you find this stuff in the documentation. If also, if you look at, for example, pandas data frame, you can see that there's a piece of documentation for pandas.dataframe. Um, and if you scroll down, this tells us like all of the different attributes for like the data frame. So the one I showed you was um, loc and iloc, so that's there. Uh, shape is an attribute, so this is how you find which ones are attributes, and if you scroll down, which are all of the methods from your pandas data frame object, right? So this library is really massive. We only have four hours, but this is how you navigate the documentation to help you figure out like what you can do. So as another aside, like Pandas was written at a hedge fund. So things dealing with time series stuff is pretty much going to be built in. So you can have cumulative sums of a column. Like all of that stuff is already built into a data frame object. You don't have to manually calculate this stuff. All right, so string accessors. So we have str. And the thing that we were looking for was split. And we are splitting on the dash, or sorry, the underscore, right? And so we essentially got back the column or um, series version of the simple case. For every single um, column in our, for every single row in our data set, we got a list. Uh, it split that uh, CD country variable by the underscore and returned us a list of cases case deaths or a country. So 
like I said, uh, we want to be able to get the first thing, set, assign that to a column called uh, case death, and then get the second thing, assign that to a column called uh, country. If you wanted to extract each part um, individually, you can use this method called get, and you can get the first thing out of, um, oops. That's not what I expected, is it? Uh -oh. Don't tell me the API changed. <laughs> Give me one second. Um, status. Hmm. That's not what I expected. Oh boy. All right. Um, uh oh. All right. Backup plan. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to show you that part. Um, if we looked at uh, string split, that actual documentation, um, there is a parameter called expand, and by default it is set to false. Um, if we did set that to true, um, I was going to show you this afterwards, but apparently this is just way easier anyway. Um, what we get back is a data frame um, for each for the split. So instead of a list, we actually get something a little bit more useful back, which is a data frame. So let's save this result. So the only thing that's different about this is the column names aren't what we expected. So we can save this and change those later. Uh, so we can say um, Ebola split is that. So um, how do we create new columns in a data frame? So the way we create new columns in a data frame is we sort of select them and pretend that that column always existed, right? So if we said, for example, Ebola long, and I said test, and I said test is equal to, I don't know, one, and we look at this, you'll see that it would have created this column called test and assign each row the value of one, right? So if it's a single scalar or a single value, it just gets recycled all the way down. And so we can do that for the same thing as before. So we can have something like Ebola long, pretend that those two columns existed. Um, so what are the two columns that we are trying to create? We're trying to create something called status and country. And then we can assign it that data frame, um, that two column data frame. So this is one way of like essentially concatenating uh, columns. And so we have our um, Ebola split. Remember, it was a two column data frame. Um, it by default just said zero and one, right? It was just a two column data frame. But we can say like, hey, we want those two column data frames essentially like concatenated or just as assigned to the status and country uh, columns in our Ebola long data set. And so we can say, we can pretend those two columns always existed, assign it, and then take that other data frame that we created and just assign it back in there. And then we have our nice tidy data set that we wanted, which is for every given observation, which is a day in the outbreak, um, what was whether or not this was a case count or a death count, the country that was in, and then also the um, count value. This one, yeah. So, you know, this this is really showing like how do you create new columns in a data frame? Pretend it always existed, subset it just like you would selecting a column out of your data frame. Okay. All right. So, 
all, all, a lot of the times, everything I've shown you right now was all about creating like long data sets, right? Like converting something from wide to long. I haven't showed you how to do it the other way. How do I pivot this thing back to the original form? And so that you will see in the next column, the next problem. Uh, variables are stored in both rows and columns. Um, what does that look like? Um, that looks like if we load up the weather data set. So we say weather pd.read csv data weather.csv. All right. So this is what, um, what happens when you have data being stored in both rows and columns. So for a given row, we have some ID, the year, the month, um, the temperature max in this case for a particular day from day D0 to D31. And then the temperature min value for D0 to 31. And one of the symptoms that you know that you have this problem is if you end up seeing a bunch of rows where a lot of the values are repeated, um, this, that's, like a, that's a symptom of this problem, that you're having rows being, uh, variables being stored in both rows and columns. So the first part, we can, this is the problem that we've had this entire time. We have D1 to D31. Uh, those should, that should be a column called day, right? And so let's fix that problem first. So that looks exactly like everything that we've been working on. So that is a melt command, weather.melt. Um, one thing I also want to mention is I've been saying data frame dot melt. If you are on, I think 0 0.23 and before, um, weather dot melt didn't exist. Melt didn't exist as a method, a data frame method. It only existed as like PD dot melt or something, um, or vice versa. I don't remember. So um, if you are trying to repeat this at home at a different computer, um, again, remember to just check the pandas version to make sure that it is at least like 0 0.23. Chirp, chirp, chirp. All right. All right. So let's save this to a variable. So it's going to be called weather, W E A, weather long, is going to be our melted data frame, which is everything that we've been working with right now. So ID vars is going to be list of ID, year, month, and element. And we can have var name is equal to day, and var value is equal to temp for temperature. And I spelled something wrong. Var, what is it? Var name. Oh, it's value name. Whoops. Value name. There we go. All right, so we fixed the first problem. We uh, melted our day down. And in this case, you'll really start to see like what happens when your variables are stored in rows, right? Everything is pretty much the same piece of information except for the, the value stored in element, right? So what I like to do when I'm working with data sets is instead of, before I even start writing code, I will take out, I will literally take out a piece of paper and pen and I will sketch out what is the data frame that I am aiming for, right? So I want a data frame where ID, where I have columns, ID, year, month, temperature min, temperature max, day, and temp, right? So I need to now take this and actually convert this column into individual columns, right? So it's the opposite uh, direction that we've been working with. So now, how do we do the opposite of melt? So there is a pandas pivot and pandas pivot table. So each data frame has these two methods. One is called pivot, and the other one is called pivot table. Um, I am going to show you pivot table. Um, it is a more generic version of pivot. Uh, they both do the same thing. Um, the only 
difference is um, you can imagine if we were looking at our data set um, for, let's say, what happens for a given ID, year, month, and day. What if two people took a reading, right? So what if these two columns or this Tmax column has two values? Um, one was NA and the other was like um, the number 10. If we pivot this and we create one column called temperature max, there's two values that are possible for temperature. And we need to be able to reconcile how do we deal with those two values. So pivot doesn't handle duplicate values. Um, in here it just says an index, a column, and then the values, and it'll just pivot that column out. If we look at the documentation for pivot table, there's actually a piece called agfunc. So by default, if you are doing this pivot, like in Excel, like a pivot table, if there are multiple values, it will by default take the mean of them. Um, but you can set that to um, anything that you want. So right now it's numpy.mean, but you can also say like numpy.max, numpy.standard deviation, uh, numpy.min, uh, whatever you need. Um, you can define your own function to handle uh, multiple um, values. So I'm going to show you a pivot table, but you can try how try to do this with regular pivot as well. Um, because I'm going to be doing um, a few operations together, uh, I'll just wrap it around round brackets. Actually, I won't show you that right now. Uh, so we have weather long, so that's what we have. Um, I'm showing you the pivot table function. And in here, uh, it takes a bunch of parameters. One of them, like I said, index. Index refers to the things that you want to hold constant. You don't want to change it. So think of it as ID. So index is going to be a list. So what are the columns that we don't want to touch? Is ID, year, month, and day, right? ID, year, month, and day. This has nothing to do with uh, the operation at hand. What we want to do is pivot out the element. So each unique value of this column element becomes its own column. So we're going to have a column called Tmax, a column called Tmin. And then we need to pick another column to fill in those values. So we're going to say temp is going to be the column used to fill it in. So columns is going to say element. So that is the columns that we're going to pivot. And then the values, what are we going to use to fill in when we pivot out that column, is going to be the temp column. All right. So um, the fact that this printed out a little wonky, we can ignore that for now. But we have essentially a column that is year, uh, ID, year, month, um, what day it was, and then a temperature max and temperature min. And like I said before, when it prints out something wonky like this, you can always say dot reset index, and you'll get a nice flat data frame back. All right, so we have our ID, year, month, day, temperature max, temperature min. There was a few things that happened under the hood. Um, so like if, it, if the value was NA, it automatically got dropped, so you don't see a bunch of NA values in here. Um, you can change that in the pivot table uh, parameters of how to do with, I think it's called like drop missing, uh, drop NA. So by default, if the value in um, that you're using to fill is NA, it'll just drop that entire row. But sometimes you want to keep it, um, so it does give you the um, option to do so. And because we're saying dot reset index, um, I can, you know, put a new line there wrap everything around a set of round brackets, just so I'm quote unquote piping the results. All right. Cool. Um, before we go to the next exercise, um, some sort of like random things in Python that I find super useful. Um, all right. What number is that? Like. 
do you know off the top, like, could you tell within like a split second what number that was? Um, chances are you probably counted a number of zeros or moved your arrows um, and realized that, okay, that's a million, right? Or what if I did this, right? It's hard to tell um, what number that is. And in Python, something really cool is if you have a number, um, the underscore doesn't count um, as part of an integer. And so um, you can put in a thousands comma uh, with an integer and it will still give you back the same value. So super helpful for uh, if you are dealing with numbers um, in Python. Um, another thing that's super useful um, is that list elements, so one, two, three, can end in a trailing comma. And so why is that useful? Uh, typically, if you are trying a bunch of things out, um, you probably will have, you know, try this out, you might comment out various things. And having the trailing comma allows you to comment out the last value without having to comment out the comma on a previous line. Right? So if you're in a bunch of other languages, you probably have to make two line changes. Uh, but in Python, because of the last trailing comma, you only really need to change that one. So uh, if you're using version control um, things, that just saves you a diff of two lines instead of one, right? Or one line instead of two. All right, so exercises. Um, so this I pretty much took from the examples from the R4 data science book. Um, it is an R book, but you know, processing data is pretty much the same thing across languages. So I have these uh, three data sets. They're, they're really small. They're, I think they're like, yeah, they're only six rows. Um, table one, table two, table three. Um, if you look at the exercises, I already saved it there so you don't have to type it out. And essentially, uh, for until 3.30, um, table one is just a clean data set. Uh, it's just to look at. Uh, table two is Right. Uh, table two is a data set that need that has a problem. Uh, type is a column that we actually want. Uh, I forgot how I wanted to clean this. <laughs> um, yeah. So cases and population as columns, but I realized that might be a problem. <laughs> Uh, so let's do it this way. Um, let's filter uh, type. Wait, does that make sense? Right. So I want a I want a column that says country, year, cases, population, and count. Ah, wait, hold on. I am I'm I am confused because I'm standing standing up here. <laughs> uh, can you repeat that? What am I? Can you help? Uh, wait. So it's country, year, cases, population. Oh, yeah, okay, that is right. So I'm gonna have a cases column that will be this value and a population count that will be that value. Yes, okay, that's what I meant. Cool, that's why I have helpers. Uh, and then the last part is sort of the opposite of that. Um, so um, we have this rate, and essentially what I want you to do is just give me the population part out of this. So for Table three, just give me the population. So um, I really only care about the population, so remember about string splitting, I guess that's the hint. Um, and then up here, remember that it's the opposite of melt, <laughs> hint, hint. And so we'll work on that for the next, until 3.30. Okay, let's go over the exercises. Um, all right, so uh, what did I want from this? <laughs> um, 
I essentially needed to uh, pivot out the type column, so I have a separate number for cases and a separate number for population. Right. So how do we do that? We have tbl2 dot piv. Uh, is that is that a table? Nope. Nope. I spelled it wrong. Uh, oh, I forgot to run all of this. All right. Dot pivot table. Um, so I'm just using pivot table because I'm sort of assuming that if there are multiple values, um, I will take the average by default. Um, ID vars is going to be uh, country, year, and that is it. Uh, say again? Uh, yes, I mean index. I'm staring at the wrong nodes, but also, uh, yes, index. Index is going to be that. Uh, the columns is going to be type. And the values is going to be count. Cool. Uh, and that's how I get that data set. Um, and if you want, you can say reset index, and you'll get your regular uh, data frame that you that we've been working with. Um, there is also a way to get rid of this column. I think it's somewhere in here. Um, I don't remember. Oh wait, it's somewhere in reset index. I think it's a parameter in reset index to get rid of this part, but um, I don't really remember off the top of my head. <laughs> Okay, next part. Uh, just give me the population portion of this. So, um, I think what I originally wanted, uh, because get doesn't work, that's sort of like, I have to figure out why get doesn't work, and they probably changed something in it, um, but we can still do something um, with it. Um, so we have table three. Uh, we are taking out the rate column, right? So that gives us all of that. We can split by the uh, slash, so str dot, dot split. We are splitting by the slash, and now we have all of those components. Um, that's super weird. Is this not? That is super weird. Anyway. Um, so this behavior is totally different. <laughs> it, like, when did that change? I don't know. Uh, I wonder if it's a bug, <laughs> because that is not a feature. <laughs> um, oh, it is str.get. Ah, that is, that is how you do it. Um, Okay, let's backtrack. <laughs> let's let's re, re show something that I, I that I wanted to show you, and I probably read off my notes wrong. Um, so we have our um, our vector of list values, and if we wanted to get, for example, um, every second value in here, uh, we have to essentially call str again. Um, some people say that you can use square bracket and say this is the zero index, this is the one index. You can say str1. Um, I usually like to be super explicit and I say get me the first one and you can get the population number that way. Um, and so now we can say something like table three, uh, population. Remember, you can assign the column to be just pretend that column always existed and run it. And now, if you look at our table, uh, we parsed out, quote unquote, parsed out the little population um, portion of it. Cool. Yes, it is str.get. That is, that is very true. <laughs> So, 
uh, we're going to create another notebook. And we're going to call this 03 apply. So now I'm going to briefly show you how to write functions in Python, but it's mainly, so how do you write a function in Python and then apply it to every row in your uh, data set so you're not writing a for loop and iterating. So functions in Python look like this. There's def as a keyword. It turns green. The name of your function surrounded by round brackets. Any um, arguments into your function can go in here. There is a colon, and then a new line, and then an indentation. So indentations in Python are pretty much mandatory. Um, the PEP8 style guide says four spaces. So we have four spaces. And then if you just want an empty function, you can say pass. Because uh, if you actually have an empty function, um, it won't like that. So. so here, where I say pass is really the body of your function. So if you wanted, for example, a function that is squaring square a number, you can say, uh, given that number, you're going to return x squared, right? So whatever value squared. And so how do you test this out? So we can just call this just like before. So if we put in two, we get four. If we put in four, we should get 16. And so I showed you um, how to write a function and you're visually inspecting it. But typically when you write a function and if you're visually inspecting it, you should probably um, write just a test for it. And the way you do that is say assert. So you have an assert statement. You're saying that, hey, if I say my square four, that should definitely equal 16. And if you run that, nothing happens. And that's good. Uh, with assert, if this expression here returns false, then you'll get an error. And if it returns true, then nothing happens. So this is sort of like the basis for like unit testing in Python. But if you're processing your data, uh, for example, if you're working with sensor data, you load it in, you should probably write an assert statement that says, like, I expect this data to have this many rows and columns, just so if you're working with a bunch of files and one of those files is, like, corrupt or just wrong, um, you actually get, like, a warning, like, exactly when it happened. And so there's nothing wrong with saying, uh, writing assert statements in the middle of your script just to make sure something is what you expect, right? So if you are ever in a case where you're visually inspecting something, and if it's something simple like this, um, write the assert statement so whenever you're, you run this script, and if that's not true, it'll actually give you the error like right here, versus you know you don't see the error like until like 50 lines later, and now you're slowly tracing back like what's going on with your data set. Um, so that's a pretty good uh, you know, uh, thing to start doing. Um, and then the more you get used to assert statements, it'll flow into like writing unit tests because um, it's all based on, around this assert statement. All right, so let's write another function, um, average two. So what do functions look like if they take two parameters? They return, uh, so x and y, and we can return, for example, x plus y divided by two. So if we say the average of 10 and 20, that should give us 15. Cool. All right, so that's just really quick intro into how to, how to write functions. Uh, what does this look like in the context of working with pandas and with data sets? So let's uh, load up pandas again, because we're in a brand new notebook. Um, pandas hasn't been loaded yet. And so here I'm going to show you how you can manually create a data frame. So pd.dataframe, so remember I showed you the documentation here. So this at the bottom shows you everything a data frame can do. But if you look at pandas.dataframe, you can actually create data frames um, with this function. So the easiest way is to use a Python dictionary, which is created with curly brackets. And so you can think of a dictionary as like the book dictionary. There is a key, which represents like the word, and then the value, which represents the definition of the word. Right? So we can have a key called A. So that's going to represent the column name. And then if we pass in any kind of 
sequence or a list or a NumPy array or something, it'll turn that into the values in that column. So we can say 10, 20, 30 for the column A. And then for the column B, we can say 20, 30, and 40. Right. So dictionaries are curly brackets. The keys have, are usually strings. Uh, technically, they have to be anything that's hashable or unique. So you can't have two um, A's in a dictionary. Uh, the keys are separated by a colon, and then the value is anything that you want. In our case, we're using a list, so square brackets and three numbers. And then here we have our, uh, I should not call that PD. I should call that DF, because PD is, that is all sorts of bad things. <laughs> uh, that, that definitely would have caused problems. All right. Um, all right, so. Pandas has something called broadcasting. So if we say, let's take the look at the A column, if we perform some kind of operation on it, like numerical operation, so square everything, that, that operation happens for every row, right? So this is called uh, broadcasting. And for a lot of numeric operations, that happens automatically. But let's say we um, calculated our own little function or we're, import, or we're using another function from somewhere else um, and, you know, that note, this notation up here, this broadcasting notation, isn't working. So now we do something called apply. So know that I'm pulling out a single column of our data frame. So this is running apply on a series. And apply, if we look at the documentation, takes a function. Um, it could take an access, but because we are working with a series, there's only one, um, one access to work with. So what is the function? We can say pass in my square. Uh, note that I am passing the function directly, my square, not my square with round brackets. So if I look at my SQ, you'll see that it's really just pointing to a function called my square, right? So I'm passing that entire function into apply, and that's how we're passing in or using that function um, for each value in our series. So that's applying that function. This function was pretty simple. It took in one value, and then that's it, right? So let's write another function that takes in a value, two values. Uh, one is going to be a number, and then the other is going to be like some kind of um, exponent. So return x to the e power, right? So now we. We run this by saying my exp, like for example, two to the tenth power should give us 1024. Cool. And then again, write an insert statement, check your work, um, write your tests. So how do we do this, for example, in the context of a series? So we want to apply this function, right? And so let's say we want to raise every value to the same constant e. So let's say we want to raise it to the fourth power. Um, what we do, if we look here, there is a parameter called star star key keyword args or quarks. And this essentially gives you access to all of the parameters in our function. So our function has a parameter called e. So we can say e is equal to four. And that will run the myexp function across every row. Each value will be passed in as the x and then E equals four will be supplied for e, uh, into our function, and that cal that's how uh, we'll make that calculation. Cool. All right. So next, just to prove a point, or just to show you, um, let's write a function that all it does is print out whatever you give it. Right. And this is really to show you what's really going on in apply. So that was with the series. So let's say let's see what happens when we apply a data frame into it. So we're going to say print me, and then uh, run that. If we look at the bottom, what ends up being returned is two none objects. Um, because this 
function didn't return anything. It just printed something and then exited. So we have two things that are none. Uh, those two things are A and B. So you can see by default, apply works column-wise. It's saying it's doing everything in column, column A, it returned none, and then did a the whole bunch of stuff for everything in column B, returned none. If we look up here, this is what actually got printed out, right? So um, column A, which is 10, 20, 30, uh, that entire column got passed into the first argument of our function, right? So that's the thing I want you to remember. Um, that entire column got passed into X, right? It wasn't each um, item in that column individually. The entire column, essentially that entire series, got passed into X, right? And then it went to the next column, and then that in the entire B column got passed into X, right? All right. So just to iterate that, show you that point a little bit more. Let's write a function that takes three values, x plus y plus z divided by three. So this function takes three parameters, um, three arguments, and adds those up and divides by three, right? So if we run average three, you'll see that you get a type error. And it's going to say average three is missing two re required positional arguments, y and z, right? And again, that's because if we look at our data frame, by default, apply works column by column. Um, if you want, there is an axis uh, where you can set it to row by row. Uh, typically, you don't want to do row by row operations. It's uh, kind of slow. It's, you probably don't need the entire row of a data frame. You're probably only needing a couple columns out of your data frame. And the reason why you don't want to apply things row-wise is because under the hood, it's going to have to type check and convert everything to the same type. And you're going to be having a big performance hit when you do that. So I'll show you how to get around that. But um, by default, apply works column by column. So the entire column A got passed into X. That's what's happening. And that's why the error message is like, you didn't give me anything for Y and Z, right? So uh, that print function that I showed you before, everything gets passed into the first argument of the function, right? So that is how apply is working. You could, for example, um, there are some functions that are you know, already vectorized. So, so what I mean by vectorize is it knows how to handle when you give everything into um, its first argument, right? So NumPy has a function called uh, mean, and so let's say we can use that version of mean instead of the one we instead of the one we hand calculated. So we can say average three apply takes an entire column. And it returns mp.mean of that column, right? Because numpy mean understands when you give it a list or entire vector of values, it knows how to handle it and iterate and calculate that um, the mean for us, right? So now if we do that, um, it knows numpy mean understands that when you pass a bunch of values into its first argument, how to make that calculation. So how do we, for example, if we wanted to rewrite our function that we wrote up here, um, let's say you know this is a function that you wrote yourself and you tested it out, um, and you know this is exactly what you want, and now you want to apply it to your data set. How would you, like, what is the naive way of uh, modifying this function? Well, first we need to make sure that it everything gets passed into the first argument. So instead of x, y, and z, we only have one argument. Everything's passed in that first thing. And since our function takes three things, we now have to redefine x, y, and z. And how do we do that? Well, everything got passed into as the first argument, so we could select each piece out uh, one at a time. Right? So that's how you, you would do it. I'm not saying that this is how you should do it. Um, we call this apply instead of average three. Right? And so 
if you wanted to rewrite your function, um, you essentially have to rewrite your function such that it takes the entire column as the first argument and then deal with it under the hood. All right. And so just so you guys see, we can also tell access to work instead of passing in each column we can have it work the other way. And the way we do that, we can say access equals. As a string columns, I think um, in the old way, it would just be access equals one. Uh, by default, it's set to access equals to zero to work column wise. And if you want it to work the other way, you say access is equal to the string columns. And you'll, you'll have an error with our function because we're doing this subsetting of Z. If we look at our data frame, if we're passing in each column at a time, there is no third argument. There is no third thing to subset. So our, our error message is going to say something like, you try to subset something out of bounds, right? Okay. So that's generally how apply works. And let's work on, let's create like a more, uh, like an easier or nicer, uh, a more realistic function. Um, and so everything that I did, um, because it is uh, a simple numeric calculation, you know, we could say like A mean, right? We didn't have to actually calculate or, or make our own mean function. Um, even something as simple as A plus B, it understands um, how to do everything um, in a vectorized form. So like item by item, element by element. So that's cool. So let's write a function where um, we actually are doing some kind of check under the hood. Right? So let's write this function uh, average two mod takes two values. If x is equal to 20, let's say that's just a bad value. Uh, right? Um, so missing values, n-a-n, all come from numpy. So when you see missing values within pandas, it's really just borrowing from the NumPy um, library. You can say np.nan with the n's capitalized, uh, with them all capitalized, or all lowercase. They all do the same thing. Uh, but you'll typically see people write it this way, or at least this is how it's going to show up um, in your data frame. Otherwise, let's actually um, make our x, make our mean calculation. Right? So this is a function that, um, all right. All right. So let's say uh, we wanted to pass in two columns, our A column and our B column. And we wanted to have it understand to work on each column or each one of those things element by element, right? So I want to say pass in the column A, pass in the column B, and then just understand that like, hey, take the first one and use that as X and Y. For the second one, use those two as X and Y's. And for the, thir for the third one, use those as X and Y's, right? So I want to be able to say something like um, average to mod DF of A and DF of B, right? I want to be able to do something like this. Right? I don't want to rewrite this function, right? Because this is a function that's simple enough that you know, I can write it on my own, I can test it, you know, try out individual values, see if it's okay, and then um, apply it to my data frame, right? That's a, that's a common task. Um, again, this goes around trying to apply it across an entire row because I, I don't need like all 10 columns or 10 values in our data frame, I only need two of them. So the problem that we're having right now is um, our function isn't vectorized. It doesn't understand when I pass in two like vectors or two series objects to handle them one at a time, right? Um, so um, NumPy has a way to automatically vectorize functions for us. So if you haven't loaded NumPy, you'll load it. 
And NumPy has a function called vectorize. Uh, this is a special function because the input of this function, this vectorize function, is another function. Right? So the function that we want to modify is this average to mod function. So that's the one we just wrote up here that checks to see if, if x is 20, if return missing, otherwise actually calculate the uh, mean for us. Right. So this function, vectorize, is a special function where another function is its input. And now we have to save this to another variable or another function. So average two mod vec. So it's just the vectorized version of this function. And now we can take this vectorized version, call it just like before, but this time we can actually call it and do it what we always wanted it to do. Right? So we pass in our data frame. So I'll show you our data frame. Um, it now understands to handle um, each thing element by element. Right? So DFA, DFB were the two values 10 and 20. Um, it, the value for x or a isn't 20, so it gives us the actual value, so it's 15. For the second one, um, the value passed into the function, the first value is 20, so it's going to return missing. And then the third one, the first value isn't 20, so it gives us 35, right? So instead of having to rewrite your function and subsetting it, et cetera, et cetera, um, use NumPy and have it vectorize the function for you. So let's copy this function again. Because this notion of, uh, of like, because this pattern is super common where you have this other function and its only input is another function and it's to modify that function. Uh, this, I guess, idiom is common enough in Python that there's a shorthand way to do this. And the shorthand way to do it is using a decorator. So right above the function that you just wrote, instead of like calling a function, resaving it out to another variable, you can say at the top right above it, say at, and then mp.vectorize, and then that's it. So you don't have to recreate another function name. You can just say, hey, this is the function I wanted before. Uh, Treat it, use it as a decorator. So this is this notation here is a Python decorator, and vectorize wraps around this whole entire function definition and re and reassigns it to this name. So now you only need to work with average two mod instead of average two mod vec, right? So it just saves you another thing, another random thing floating around in your namespace. So if we run this, this does exactly the same thing as before. So a df B, and there, right? So if you write your function, uh, test it however way you want with individual use cases, and then when you're ready to use it on your data set, where you're gonna pass in columns for um, each of those parameters, just write up, right above the top, say mp at np.vectorize, and then that's it. Then you can just use that function exactly the way you want it. Cool. Uh, for those of you working with numeric computations. Um, so there's another way. Um, there's a library called Numba. Um, I just realized I don't think I put this in the install uh, thing. So you don't have to uh, run this part if you don't have Numba installed, because I think that might take a really long time to install. Um, but it's really just to show you the same exact thing that's going on. So I'm going to copy this piece up here. And Numba has. Uh, a vectorize function as well. I am now going to call this Numba. Cool. So Numba also has a vectorize function. And Numba is really a library that pretty much takes all of the calculations from um, that, that deal with NumPy and tries to make it really, really fast. And so now we can do something like, uh, just like before, DFA, DFB. And so here, you're going to see a problem. Cannot determine number type of something panda series, right? And that's because, again, number is one of those libraries that like, it really only expects uh, NumPy 
uh, arrays. And so it doesn't understand what a series is, right? It's really like, it's a high performance language, so it's really optimized to understand like, I'm dealing with NumPy, and I'm gonna make all my optimizations off of NumPy. And so how do we deal with this if you're doing with like, just numeric computations in your, um, in your data frame? So remember the three parts of a data frame, columns, index, and values. So here is one case where you say dot values. And so you get the NumPy array representation of your column, and then you can pass that into your Numba vectorized um, function, right? And you only need to do this because Numba under, only understands how to work with NumPy arrays. And that's one of the assumptions they make so you can, so they can make it faster. All right. So the last cool thing, um, this is sort of one of those things that is Jupyter, it's really IPython specific, but it shows up pretty, it's pretty cool to see it on uh, Jupyter Notebooks, is each one of these cells, you can actually use it to uh, profile or time your code. So if you say percent, percent, time it, uh, whoops, uh, whatever piece of code that you put in there, it, it will actually run like a benchmark and it'll time it. So let's time average two, df a, df b. Right? So this is the function that we wrote ourselves, right? And let's compare it to uh, the function that we did um, uh, with numpy, what did we call this, average two mod? Average two mod, uh, df a, df b. And then we can compare this to percent percent time it with number. All right, cool. Um, so the point is um, just using something like at vectorize, if you're doing numeric computations, uh, you could just get performance benefits like for nothing. Um, so you can see like the way when we try to vectorize it, it was 45, at least for me, it was some, some amount of speed. Uh, with NumPy in this case, it was about twice as fast. And then with uh, Numba, it was some, some other factor. <laughs> Uh, of order of 100 uh, times faster. And this is just, you know, this is for numeric computations. And so this is something that you can always try um, that is pretty much like of no effort on your part other than just putting at numba.vectorize or at numpy.vectorize. Cool. All right, next, uh, until for 20, let's take a break. But we're going to work with that table three um, data set again, right? Um, and so we're gonna write a function this time. So instead of writing str.split, let's just write a generic function. Um, it takes the rate value um, as a, it takes this column as its input and parse it out yourself, right? So um, it's going to come in as a string so look at the Python string manipulation method. So it's really just dot split again. Um, and pull out the total population. So pull out the second value, and that's what the function will return. Right? So we're doing the same thing as dot the string accessor, but a lot of times when you're processing data, it's going to involve processing strings. So you're going to like this, you can in put in place like a regular expression, right? Um, that's going to be really common. So write a function that takes something of that column and parses it out so you just get the total population value. And then you can use the apply um, or you can say um, data frame square bracket population and assign that value um, back in um, to create a new column. Right. So we're going to do that until 4, 420. Um, so walk around if you need to, get coffee, um, get snacks, get candy. Uh, and we'll go over to solution at 420. So we're three minutes late, I lied, but it's fine. Uh, okay, so this task is pretty much the same thing that we did earlier um, with str split, um, but 
we're going to do, I'm showing you this as an example to do this manually because you are eventually going to have to write your own function and not rely on stuff that's built in, right? So it says to write a function that takes a value of rate and parses out the total population. So let's look at the D types of table three, table three dot D types, right? So the rate is an object, right? And th in this case, that means it's a string. Um, so why I'm also showing you how to write a function this way is because let's say you have a data frame of a bunch of URLs and you know, you're trying to um, scrape a bunch of URL pages. You can literally have a column that's, you know, your requests objects, right? You can have open up requests and then just save your request object as another column. And that's just an object. And then you can say request dot like get HTML as another column, et cetera, et cetera. So um, in each of those steps, you'll probably have your own function to like parse out whatever you need, um, extract out whatever you need. So this is the general case of that. So we have our D types and we'll write a function. So we'll say define um, extract population takes a rate. Um, so this rate is coming in as a string. So we can say rate dot split and it is coming in as a slash. And we can say population is the second thing after the slash, and we can return it, right? So we can sort of write our assert statement of if I give it a string of one, two, three, slash four, five, six, um, this should actually return back um, a string four, five, six, four, five, six, and it does, all right? Um, you can also do things like convert this thing into an integer. Um, and so it comes back as four, five, six, the number. Um, so you can do stuff like that. All right, so that's the function. And in here, this can be whatever you need to parse out, right? This could be some ungodly uh, regular expression. You can also say like the limb by default is going to be a slash. And so you can have a function that is a little bit more generic and doesn't always work on. Um, you can always say position is one, and then you can subset things this way. Um, so you can build out this function as you need um, with default arguments that you can change and reuse in other cases, right? So how do we use this? Um, we have table three. Uh, we're passing in the rate um, column. We're going to apply our extract population and that pulls out the population. And we can either save this to a, uh, a variable and assign it to a new column, table three pop equals pops. We can do it that way, right? Or we can say table three pop two and then that entire apply statement right here, we can um, run the apply statement and assign it directly all in one line. So I wouldn't worry about which one is more efficient or not, um, but you'll see people write things like, hey, I'm going to make this calculation off of my function and assign it straight to that column, uh, create a new column that way. And you'll see that the results are exactly the same. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is, this is in 64, but this is such a small number, what if we wanted in eight? Um, there is a way to do that, and I think it's, uh, if it's a number, there is a pandas function called like two numeric, and you can convert a column into a numeric value. And in there, I think you can specify the numeric type. And it's any of the numpy numeric, so it can be int eight. Um, 
there is a more general one called, um, like you can say column dot as type, and you can turn the column into like a category or a string or a float. Uh, but typically if you are trying to work with numbers, use the to numeric function because it handles non-numeric values better. So if you have a column that's uh, an object, but it's like two, four, six missing, um, if you use as type, it's gonna fail. But if you use to numeric, it'll turn missing into NA. So it'll know how to handle that. And in that function, you can say like actually down, I think it's called downcasting, like downcast everything to like an int, whatever version or a float, um, whatever version that you need. Okay. All right, we're almost done. <laughs> um, so the last thing is uh, plotting, and then we'll talk about dummy variables and sort of like a little bit of scikit-learn, um, and then we'll call that a day. So, so we're going to need pandas. Um, we're going to use Seaborn as our plotting library and the tips data set um, for our actual data set. Right, so this is the data set that's built into Seaborn. Um, it's, if you work with, like, if you look at like Pandas documentation and examples enough, like, you're probably sick of this data set. Um, but it comes with a package, so it saves sort of like the download um, through Wi-Fi. Um, another thing that we're going to use is import matplotlib dot pyplot as plt. So those of you that were at the matplotlib tutorial, uh, you probably saw this already. Uh, the reason for importing this is uh, a lot of the static plotting libraries in Python are really just wrappers around matplotlib. So Seaborn is really built on top of matplotlib. It just gives you, I think it gives you a nicer interface to make plots with. Uh, Pandas data frame objects also have plotting built in and it's really just wrappers around matplotlib. So we'll see what that looks like. Um, so the first thing is, let's say you just want to write, uh, make really quick plots off of columns that you have. So when you're processing data, you don't have to make every single figure, um, every single figure you make doesn't have to be the one that's going to be published, right? Sometimes you just want to know like what is going on. So let's look at our tips data set. Um, we have a column called tip and for a given column, we can actually just say plot. Um, plot is a built-in uh, method for a series, and you can see by default, kind is going to be a line. So what kind of plot do you want to make? And this is all um, built on top of matplotlib. Since tip is a numeric column, um, a line plot in this case doesn't make too much sense. And so uh, one of the kinds is called hist, and it'll give you a histogram. And what it will give you back is a matplotlib axes. And if you are in the Jupyter Notebook system, um, it will plot out and put in the figure right here. If you are sort of like in a, in a text editor and you want this thing to show up, this is where you're gonna see plt.show to actually render the figure out for you. So, so what if we want to actually create like a bar plot of counts or something? Um, so we can get, for example, what's one of these? Uh, let's look at smoker. So you can see here I'm using the dot notation instead of square bracket notation. So that's just because I know smoker is not going to be an actual attribute in our data set. But remember, if there was a column called shape, for example, or capital T, uh, that will give us not the column, but the actual like transpose or the number rows and columns in our data set. So let's look at smoker. There is a panda series object called value counts. Uh, value. And this will give us um, a series of for each value like the number of counts. And so we can take this, say dot plot, kind equals bar. 
and it'll plot us out a bar plot, right? So this is all using plotting within pandas. Okay, cool. Um, I'm sort of just going to show you like what this looks like in Seaborn. Um, so I personally like to use Seaborn because I understand how to plot using ggplot in R. And so Seaborn is sort of the closest thing to ggplot. And so that's sort of personally why I like plotting with Seaborn. So in Seaborn, um, how do we create uh, count plots? So we can say SNS. So remember, we imported Seaborn as SNS. Um, and so we're saying here, if we want a count plot or a bar graph, uh, we can say count plot. And then in here, uh, the syntax looks sort of reminiscent of ggplot if you're familiar with it. So you can say x is equal to sex or whatever column. So we said smoker. Um, and then data is tips. And then we get a uh, Seaborn plot of the same thing as before. What I also like about Seaborn, it's sort of geared towards like statistical plots. So we can say Seaborn.distribution plot. So this is useful for, you know, continuous variable columns. And here we can just pass in like the entire column directly. So we don't have to say x equals this, data equals that. We can pass in an entire vector. So we can say pass in a total bill and this plot by default will actually draw out a histogram and also plot a uh, kernel density um, over it. You can see that the scale is really all, um, it's scaled um, for us by default. But in this plot, there's a whole bunch of other um, things that you can see. So KDE, you can say KDE is false. And it'll actually just give us the histogram. So um, one thing why I like, so one of the draws that I really like ggplot was the fact that you can pick individual uh, variables. And for example, like I want color by this and shape by this, um, et cetera, et cetera, um, to do that really quickly. And so there are, the reason why I also like Seaborn is it allows you to add um, attributes um, to color or uh, change different shapes in your data, in your figure pretty quickly. So Let's say we wanted to draw a line graph or a line plot. Uh, we can use something called LM plot um, to create our line graphs. And LM plot is really like fitting a linear regression, so LM for linear regression plot. Um, so here, again, if you want to see the function signature, it's shift tab within the round brackets. We can give it a x, so what do we want to plot on the x-axis for our scatter plot, the y, the data, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So we can say x is equal to uh, total bill, y is equal to tip, data is tips, and that will give us a scatter plot. And by default, it's going to draw out like this linear regression. So that's why it's called LM plot. But there's other stuff. Um, if we look at the function signature, there's Q, column, row, um, markers, et cetera. So we can do something like hue, color, put a different color for each value of sex. And you can see we can very quickly just say, okay, for each different value of sex for total bill and tip, like draw a separate line or draw a separate, uh, just color them differently. So you can sort of tease out very quickly like if there's a pattern within your data set. Um, if you don't like that line that's being drawn, there's a parameter called fit reg that's default set to true. So we can say fit reg is equal to false. And I'll draw out our scatter plot without the regression line. And one of the other things that I find super useful is some of these, not all of the Seaborn plots, uh, not all of the Seaborn functions have a parameter for a column and row. But in LM plot there is. So what this allows us 
you to do is you can say column is, for example, smoker. And it will automatically create a facet for us. So I'm saying this is the plot, this is the scatter plot for smoker equals yes. This is the scatter plot for smoker equals no. So you can, it's essentially subsetting your data set and then plotting two separate scatter plots, right? Um, and this is why I really like Seaborn because it, if you compare this to matplotlib, um, I believe you have to create, manually create your individual axes and all of a sudden you're writing a for loop to write a plot. And that doesn't make sense to me. Um, so with column, you also have something called row. So what is some other variable? I think I can put in sex here. And then so for each column, I'll have, oh wait, no, sex, I already used sex. What did I, time? What's in our data set? I don't even remember. Tips.columns. <laughs> uh, day, right? So we can have day. And so for every column, so remember like col for column and row, they have to be actual like categorical values. It doesn't make sense if it's a numeric. But you can see here, this is like Thursday smoker, yes. Thursday smoker, no. This is Friday smoker, yes. Friday smoker, no. Saturday smoker, yes. Saturday smoker, no. And it can, this is called like a faceted plot, right? So it can subset our data set by those two columns and then plot its individual scatter plot. And I also said like put a, put a color in there, right? So like I really, if I zoomed out uh, a little bit, like this one figure that it created uh, uses one, two, three, four, five. It's plotting five variables for us, right? And it's pretty simple in that case. Um, you don't have to write any uh, random for loop. Uh, you don't have to specify the um, components individually. Let me just scroll up so you can actually see the code. Um, you just say like, hey, this is my X, this is my Y, this is my color. I want the columns on this variable. I want the rows on that variable, like, and then go do your thing. Um, I think other, um, what other, the plotting library that Jake Vanderplas works on uh, that's built on top of Vega that I don't remember. <laughs> Altair, yeah, Altair has like a very similar plotting syntax. And I forgot the exact thing, what it's called. It's like, there's like a whole grid of like different plotting like paradigms. And so like, I really like this type of plotting paradigm because it, again, if you're working with data sets or you're trying to make statistical plots, like this makes a lot of sense. And it's pretty simple to do that. Um, so one of the other things is sometimes not every, um, not every function has like column or row or hue, right? Um, so Seaborn actually gives you the ability to create like a facet grid and then you can put in any type of plotting function in there and then it'll know how to split up your data set. So it's essentially like doing a group by and then for each group making its own separate plot. Um, so you can do that in Seaborn as well, and it's called a facet. Um, so making these individual panels is called faceting, and in Seaborn it's called creating or using a facet grid. So first we need to create our facet, so which is essentially saying like, what subset of our data are each of these like boxes going to be? We, cre we create this object called a facet grid. So we're essentially creating like an empty canvas and defining like how many components are going to be in there. So in our facet grid, we have to give it our data set. So we're saying tips. And then we can give it like anything else. So um, do we want to specify how we want to map the rows, the columns, the hue, et cetera, et cetera. So we can say column is going to be, you know, time, Row is going to be smoker, and hue is going to be sex, right? So all that did was create this grid for us, right? It didn't make any plot yet um, because we haven't specified what we want in it, but it really just knows like, okay, anytime you want me to draw a plot, this is how I know how to break it up. All right, so in the same cell, like don't make a new cell because you actually need this already it's sort of like drew out the canvas already, so you actually still need to use it. Now we're saying facet.map. And essentially map, um, you can think of it as like apply. Um, and so it's saying like, hey, we're going to use a plotting function, and we're gonna use this plotting function for each one of these facet grids. And so if you 
know from the matplotlib um, tutorial, there is this plt.scatter that can automatically create scatter plots or using matplotlib to create scatter plots. And in scatter, in PLT scatter, you tell it like, what do you want to plot on the x-axis? What do you want to plot on the y-axis? So you can say total bill and then tip. So that's what we wanted before. And now if we run this, uh, this is the matplotlib scatter um, function being used in a Seaborn facet grid, right? So you don't have to use like pure matplotlib, make out your individual, like draw out your figure, make it each individual axes, and then like iterate and loop and draw out each one of those components. All right. So how does this all work? Um, I like to look at matplotlib matplotlib parts of a figure. All right. I know Tom doesn't like this photo, but I still use it. <laughs> um, so he can deal with it because it's still on the documentation page. <laughs> um, so this was the old parts of a figure diagram. Um, I still like this because it very clearly defines um, each of the major components. So the actual thing is a figure. Um, inside a figure, you can have multiple axes. So that's A-X-E-S. Um, so if you have, you can also for a given figure have essentially two subplots and each subplot is its own individual axes, right? For a given axes, you have two axes, A-X-I-S. Um, so an axis has two axes, and all of those axes together form a figure. Uh, the new anatomy of a figure looks like this. Um, only this is useful if you need to know every other part. So if you're in matplotlib, you need to be able to target like the title, the legend, the grid, the line, the major tick, minor tick. So this is actually a better figure to get a better sense of what's going on. My only problem is like axes is just this random circle here. And it's just like, okay, what is this? <laughs> it's like, what is this pointing at? Uh, so I personally don't like that. Um, and I like the other one before. And it also shows you the whole entire figure. So I usually show the two of them. Um, if you get this one, you get generally what's going on. And then if you need, here are all of the other parts of a figure. Um, the other reason why they like this is they actually drew this completely in matplotlib, and I think this was like, I don't know, paint <laughs> or Inkscape. So, so um, I'm going to refer to this, and this is important because if you're creating subplots, so let's say you just want um, two totally different plots that have not that don't really have anything to do with each other, but you want it in one figure because that's what you need in your paper. Is like, uh, like some, for some weird reason, the journal is like you're only allowed two figures, and so you have like figure one with like parts A to Z, right? And it's still one figure. Um, how do you do something like that? Um, so this is when you actually have to like dive down and manually specify the figure and manually specify each individual axes. And so how do we do that? So the way we can do that is we can say um, there is a function in matplotlib called uh, subplots. And we can give subplots uh, how many rows or columns um, we want our entire figure to contain. So we can say our subplots is one row and one column, meaning we just have one thing in our figure. Um, there is a Python syn uh, quick syntax for, um, Jeez, what is this called? Tuple unpacking. So what this is really doing is if I say like a comma b is one, two, I can say print a, print b, right? So if given like a list or a tuple or a bunch of stuff, I can sort of like element wise assign them in Python. So this is what we're doing here. PLT subplots gives me back a figure object and a bunch and all of its individual axes. And so in this case, we only have one. Uh, technically, this is in, uh, is a tuple. So we have one figure and one axis, axes, A-X-E-S, right? And it's labeled A-X. And so before, when we were looking at Seaborn plots, um, if I scroll up a little bit, maybe 
not this one, a lot of these Seaborn plots return an axes object. And so that means you can take this and shove it into that component in the matplotlib figure, right? So when you're looking at the Seaborn documentation, um, pretty much for a given function, scroll down to see like what does it return. Sometimes they return back an entire figure. Uh, I think like there's another version of lmplot that returns the entire figure. And some of the functions in Seaborn return an axes. And so what you're looking for is if it gives you back an axes, um, you can use that as one of these subplots. All right, so how do we now actually like plot something in here? So for a given axis, um, we can use default matplotlib, right? So this is an axis, we can say scatter, using the matplotlib scatter, uh, what are we going to put in? Tips.tip um, versus tips.totalbill, right? So this is creating one entire figure. This has one essentially subplot in it. And we're using matplotlib to put in tip on the x-axis, total bill on the y-axis. So I can copy that first line. And we can do, we can make like a figure with two things. Um, so remember, in here, it's number of rows and number of columns. So let's say I wanted a figure with one row and two columns, so two figures right next to each other. So now it's gonna still give me back the figure, but now it's going to give me back two axes objects. And so how do I capture them? So that's why I put this in round brackets, um, because it comes back as like a list. So we have AX1, AX2, right? And so now it gives us back a figure with two subplots in them. And this like round bracket thing is like something that took me like an embarrassingly long time to figure out like how this function works. Um, so, and now that we have those individual AX1, AX2 variables, um, we can plot on them directly, right? So the other weird thing with matplotlib when you're working in the Jupyter notebook is all your plotting code really has to be in the same cell, right? So if you, if you already like drew out the thing, you can almost be like, hey, I already used all my paint to draw that, so if you tell me to draw something else, I ran out of paint. Um, so uh, sometimes when you're like tinkering around and like moving things in the Jupyter notebook, like especially with plotting, like just put all your plotting code into the same cell. So we can say AX1 scatter, and that can be the same thing as before, tips.tip, tips.totalbill. And then AX2 can be the second plot. We can say, let's just have a regular histogram. And there you go. So we have two individual um, subplots, and we're telling matplotlib, put a scatter plot here, put a histogram there, and this is how we make them. All right? And somewhere in subplots, there's different ways of um, this figure keyword. Um, you can set like the dimensions, the, um, the resolution, um, all of that other stuff will all come back as uh, keyword arguments. So you can, you know, reshape this stuff as needed. Yeah. Ah, so. Yeah, so what I sort of just resorted and I stopped, I, using square bracket notation. Uh, this dot, dot column is really just a shorthand for, if you just need one column, it saves you about three, at least three key, keystrokes. Uh, so, um, so you can always use dot column as a shorthand for a column. The only thing you have to be very careful of is if the column is also like an attribute of a data frame. So I keep using like info, like for example, info, uh, or shape, or capital T, um, anywhere in like the pandas uh, data frame uh, documentation, like if it's listed there, like apply, if you have for whatever reason a column called apply, um, if you use dot apply, it's not gonna work. So the square bracket with quote will always work, um, but this is a, just a really convenient shorthand. All right, so that's how you work with uh, matplotlib. So what does this look like for Seaborn? So uh, tips.tip, SNS, 
dist plot. There we go. All right. So if we look at the type of this, you'll see that it comes back as an axis, right? So that's good. That means that if given um, one of these um, subplot or axis objects, we can actually plot that in there. So what does that look like if we wanted to use um, Seaborn instead of matplotlib? So let's create those two axes again. So fig is axis one, axis two is plt.subplots, plots one and two. So we're gonna have one row with two uh, columns, or so two figures next to each other. So if you look at the um, documentation for dist, this plot. So before it was like axes dot something, and that's how we called that plot lib. Um, how do we use this um, from the Seaborn side? If we look at a lot of these Seaborn things that uh, return an axes, it says ax equals none. And so if we draw out or if we plot out the figure that we wanted, so we can say tips dot tip, that's the disk plot that we want. In AX, we can actually give in the axis object, and it knows to plot that in the figure. So that's how you use that portion of it. So same thing with reg plot. So I think LM plot is the one that returns back an entire figure. So if you wanted like that scatter plot with the line, but in axis form, you have to use reg plot. So here we can say X is equal to total bill, Y is equal to tip, data is tips, and then we can say axis is AX2. And, right? So in Seaborn, when you look at the documentation for all of these uh, figure functions, look for the AX parameter, and then when you create the matplotlib figure with its um, subplots, you can pass in those objects in there, and that's how we'll know how to plot those into the uh, subplots in matplotlib. Right, so that's all I wanted to cover about plotting, because uh, plotting can go on forever, but those are the main take takeaways. Um, so personally, I like to use Seaborn, um, and then if you are trying to create more complicated plots, you still gonna, you're eventually gonna have to touch matplotlib, and you can create these axes objects that you can pass into your Seaborn um, figure calls, and then that's how you'll draw, your, draw out your figures. All right, so. Um, can we skip this? <laughs> uh, we'll take a break, um, but I will just post the, so I'll just do this solution and talk you through it. So um, we'll come back at like 5.10. Um, but the thing is, uh, we'll work with the Titanic data set. We'll create one figure with two axes. We'll create a disk plot for fair on one and a box plot for class and fair for the other. So that's, that's the actual exercise. So we'll take a 10 minute break and then I'll just show you the very last bit and then we can call it a day. How's that? All right, so 510. So Welcome. let's just quickly talk over the solution for the exercise. So we have our Titanic data set and we're, this is a data set of who survived on the Titanic given a bunch of statistics. For example, what class they were in, the gender of the person, how old they were, how much money did they spend for the fare. Um, and you pretty much find out that like, uh, only like the women and children that are, were like wealthy were the ones that survived <laughs> um, in, during the Titanic. But there's, there's a data set that you can actually prove yourself that was the case. So um, the exercise was to uh, create a figure um, with two components or two subplots. Um, the first one is a distribution of the fare. So you can see that like a lot of people had like really cheap tickets and a few people had like really expensive tickets and that was using the distribution plot. Um, so I am creating a, uh, a matplotlib figure with two subplots in them. Um, and I'm naming those axes as AX1, AX2. And when I'm using Seaborn, I can use the AX um, keyword, um, the AX parameter, and pass in those axis arguments in there. And so for the second one, I can say box plot 
Um, whoops. That is weird that it sort of knows uh, where to put that to. I uh, don't know why. Um, but, and for the next one, for a particular class and affair, um, that's what I have. So you can see first class, second class, third class. You can see that first class tickets were more expensive than the third class tickets. Uh, so that's it. So that's how you create multiple subplots. And again, this can be any set of shapes that you want. Um, somewhere along the lines, I, I don't know exactly where, but you can have figures where, you know, subplots take up multiple spaces. So you can have so, some that are squares, but some that take up multiple rows or multiple columns. Um, that's somewhere in Matplotlib. Um, I personally don't make those very often, so, um, but it is doable. Okay, so the last part, um, last notebook. It says, it says modeling, but I'm not really, I'm not really trying to teach statistics in 20 minutes because I, that's never a good idea. Um, but the point, um, so if the, if the goal is to say like, okay, what is some bare minimum from pandas that you can transition to all the other libraries? Um, the thing I want to show you is like, how do you prepare your data set? Like you have everything cleaned up. What is like the last thing you might need to do before you decide and go fit a model? And so uh, we'll be using scikit-learn for this. So let's import all the libraries that we need. Pandas as PD import. So we're using Seaborn's data set again. Um, but we're saying from sklearn import linear model. Model, M-O-D. S-K-L-E-A-R-N. Scared me. Um, so in here, um, Scikit-Learn is like a massive library, and typically you're only using like a couple models for a given script. You're never using all of the models. Um, that is <clears throat> AI. Uh, <laughs> but so here we're just going to fit a regular linear regression model. So we're just going to say import the linear regression model object. Um, so how do we create a linear regression model? So let's first get our tips data set. So tips is sns.load data set tips. And so this is the tips data set that we've been uh, tips head that we've been working with all workshop. So let's create our linear regression uh, object. So LR for linear regression. We're using linear model. So this, if you're not used to this import, because we said from import this, we no longer need to say sklearn dot. We're just directly importing this. Um, just so you know, like this is why putting a star there is a bad idea because we can just say linear model. We don't have to say sklearn dot linear model or anything. So there are a bunch of linear models. Um, the one that we are doing using is called linear regression. So we can create this linear regression object. And so um, what's nice about learning sklearn is like the API is so popular that a lot of other modeling libraries um, look like sklearn. So first, you create the model object that you want to work with, and then you put in the data that you want to fit. So this model object, so this linear model, we can say dot .fit. And then in here, in dot .fit, this is the notation. There is an x and a y. So X, capital X, um, really, it's really a matrix. So you can think of that as all of the predictors or the independent variables in your data set. And then Y is, your, is a single vector. So that's why it's lowercase. Um, and that is your response, value, um, response vector or your dependent variables in your data set. So, um, so what is going to be x? So x, we can say tips, um, and then we can say, we can use two columns. Um, using one, col one variable for the x input gets a little wonky, so I'm not, just for time, I'm not going to show you, uh, uh, but you can see it in the notes on how to fix it. So let's say, let's predict on total bill and size, and then the y, or our predictor variable, value or our response value is going to be tips uh, tip. Cool. So that fit our linear regression model. 
And how do we look at what's in here? If we wanted our coefficients, it's coef underscore, and that is the beta coefficient for uh, total bill. So the way you would interpret this is for every $1 increase in total bill, um, given that size is the same, the tip increases by uh, 9 cents. So that's how you interpret that number. And then likewise for size, um, you say for every one person increase in size, give, assuming that the total bill is the same, the tip increases by about 19 cents. Right? So that's how you interpret those values. If you need the actual coefficient, uh, or sorry, the intercept, it's intercept dot. And this is really just saying, um, usually, don't inter, usually don't interpret this, but in this case, it's essentially saying, Given that like total bill is zero and no one shows up, the tip is just by default like 67 cents, right? So that's how you would quote unquote interpret the intercept, but you usually don't do that. Uh, yes, somewhere in here you can. Uh, I never thought about doing that for this. <laughs> usually, yeah, I, th there are use cases for why you would force it to be zero. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the main point is. Um, what about these other variables, right? Like, what does it mean to, like, have a one unit increase in, in like, sex? Like, that doesn't make any sense, right? Like, if we put in sex um, as a variable in our predictor here, for example, uh, we actually get an error because it doesn't know how to convert um, a string to uh, a floating point object, right? Because under the hood, all of the uh, machine learning algorithms, um, that's really just math. Right? It's really just running matrix operations under the hood. So uh, we need to be able to convert our data frame into, a, in, into essentially like a numeric matrix. And so the words that you need to know, uh, depending on which field that you're coming from, if you're coming from the statistics field, it's called dummy encoding. If you're coming from computer science, or really this comes from electrical engineering, it's called one-hot encoding. So it's how you convert categorical variables into numbers, right? So pandas has a function. So if you look up, if you want to do this operation within scikit-learn, it's called one-hot encoding. And you can do one-hot encoding within scikit-learn. Uh, but if you're trying to prep your data set in pandas, um, you will look up dummy encoding. So pandas has a, uh, I import pandas, pd, pd, get dummies. All right. So pandas has this function called get dummies. And what that does is for every column that's not numeric, so sex was not numeric, smoker was not numeric, day was not numeric, it will convert it into a, um, a dummy variable. So what that means is if you have male and female, um, if you were female, you get a value of one. If not, then it's automatically zero, right? So, um, so in this case, you would read, this is a female person who was not a smoker and, sorry, the server was female, they were not in a smoking section, and this meal was done on a Sunday, right? And so that's how you read that. And that, we converted everything into a number, right? Like, there's no longer um, any part of the body of our data set that's a string. So typically what ends up happening if you're following like linear regression rules is if you're doing dummy encoding, so for example, sex has two values, male and female, in this data set at least, um, you have K um, values this can have. Typically you end up with K minus one dummy variables. What does that mean? If the person is already female, then you don't need another column saying that they're not male. It's encoding the same bits of information. And for linear regression, you that's, that is two, like these two variables like pretty much like define each other. So you typically try to drop that. Um, and so there is a parameter in get dummies called drop first. And you set that to true. And then what that does is it gives you n minus one values back. So sex now only has female, smoker only has no, because if, if that value is a yes, then it's automatically assumed it's not the other one. 
So for day, if it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, um, you can see that at least in this case, Thursday was dropped, right? So when all of these values are zero, then you know it's Thursday. Um, same with time for dinner. If, it's, if this value is one, then you know it's not lunch, right? And so that's how you prep your data set for um, those categorical values, uh, variables. So we can say, now we can say tips, dummy. And then we can take our same exact linear regression model code up here. So LR model, we can type this fit. And now we can put in, um, we can now put in the columns that we want, right? So we can say, Y is tips. And then here, um, you know, you could, you can say something like, let's fit this model. Uh, this is sort of where iloc ends up being somewhat useful. Um, let's not throw in total bill. Like, there's a way to rearrange this stuff, but I'm not, um, just for the sake of time. So this is 0, 1, 2. We can say 2 to the end. And we can, whoop, sorry, all of the rows, but 2 to the end. Uh, I look, uh-oh, uh-oh, female. Oh, it's, sorry, it's not tips, it's tips dummy. So we can now fit a model of tip and then include all of the other variables of size, sex, smoker, day of the week, and time of day, right? And then we would get our coefficients this way. Um, and then you would interpret those as, for example, let's interpret the last one. So this says time is dinner. So what this is is saying everything is always in linear regression a one unit increase. So what does it mean for, to go from zero to one? That means um, if this person is having dinner versus lunch. So if you are having dinner, then your tip is going to increase about 49 cents, assuming everything else is the same. Right? So that's how you interpret these values. Um, and so I didn't really want to talk too much about fitting models, but the main point that I was trying to get across is when you do end up fitting models, some, some um, Some models that you fit can't have, can't deal with categorical values and you have to manually create your dummy variables. And so you can do that in pandas with the get dummies um, function that way. And so that's the last thing I wanted to show you. Um, in the exercises, um, I'll just put the solution up online, but it's really the same thing. Um, and I also like just filled it out just for um, time's sake. But um, we have our Titanic data set. You'll see that there's certain things that are not numbers. So like sex is not a number, embarked. Um, there are actual categories. Um, the Titanic data set is also weird because one of these things like, um, yeah, like deck is like a only has 203 like valid numbers, valid responses, and that's like something that you're just, is one of the columns that you'll drop because it, there's too many missing values to actually fit a model with. <laughs> um, but these things that don't end up being floating point numbers or integers, um, you would have to do something like PD dot get dummies, drop the first thing. Um, you'll get something like the various classes, and then you can finally fit a model. Um, in this case, um, linear regression is useful when your outcome variable is an actual number, like continuous. So like in tips, um, it is a continuous variable. So you'll end up doing linear regression. Um, but um, if your outcome variable is something that's like a binary category, for in this case, like did this person survive yes or no? If it's like a yes or no binary response, then you'll do something called logistic regression. And so, but the other point I was trying to make is um, the final code of all this looks exactly the same. You'll define a capital X, you'll define a lowercase y, you um, create your, in this case, logistic regression instead of linear regression. Um, and then at the end, you say dot fit, you put in your two value, um, values, and then you can still get your coefficients back. Right? So the scikit-learn API is super consistent in that sense, that all of the models look something like this. Um, in this case, I just have a bunch of other stuff. That's just because this model behaves, has other parameters that you can fit in. And now that I think about it, this is where you would force the intercept to be zero. 
yeah, so this is where you would put that. Um, and then the fit is just like, here's my data, here's how I define my model object, now go do your actual thing. So that's it. Um, we are pretty much at time. That is everything I wanted to show you. Um, I'll finish off this exercise and post it online so you guys can at least see it. Um, and then at least for the linear regression stuff, like I'll actually write down the blurb of how you like interpret those numbers because it's super specific and technical from a st statistician's point of view. Um, but yeah, so that's all I have to show you guys. If you have any questions, come to me after this. There's a Slack uh, channel for pandas. You can message me there. Um, there's also that data data buddy thing if you need help loading data into pandas me or someone else will help you there, uh, and that's it. And the last thing is everyone has a sticky note. Um, somewhere, write something good, something bad, um, just as feedback, and then you guys can enjoy the rest of the conference.